Morning, everybody. Welcome back. Before we get into today's episode, you know who this is brought to you by. Let's get through the business portion of this. It's brought to you by Black Rifle. Let's go to their website right now in real time and talk about what they have available. BlackRifleCoffee.com. Pumpkin spice is the first thing that you're going to see. Apparently, September 1st is when all the psychotic people who look forward to fall every year are legally allowed to lose their fucking mind. And your home becomes a time bomb, ticking time bomb, an exploding time bomb of fall. So for all of you out there who have pumpkins as your doormats, I feel you because we're in the same boat right now. And if you want a pumpkin spice latte, guess what? It's available now. Let's rotate through the banner here. You can join the club. They have the coffee clubs. You get 20% off when you uh, start a coffee subscription using the code COFFEE20. You can, oh, this is interesting. This is a new one. They have a quiz that will walk you through some questions to determine what kind of coffee fits your flavor, palette, and profile the best. I like that idea. And then 15% off of coffee bundles. What I'm not seeing on here is that Bass Cat Boat giveaway, which I am so incredibly happy. I don't have the words to describe how much that warms my heart because I hate that boat, even though I know nothing about it. Bottom line is this. That's just the top rotating banner. If you scroll down, you're going to find everything from how to make coffee, what to make it in, what you can drink coffee out of. You really can just fill it the way that you want to. Um, And don't forget, holiday season is right around the corner. Stocking stuffers, coffee cups, bags of coffee, ECS subscriptions, all of those things. So head over to BlackRifleCoffee.com for all your needs. My guest today, Tyler Carnivale. I met Tyler when we were in Antarctica, and he was there having just finished a summit of Mount Vincent, which is the highest mountain in Antarctica. He was working for SpaceX at the time. I may or may not have uh, finagled the Wi-Fi code out of him when we were down there in ALE. Sorry, Mr. McDowell. And shortly after that, he decided he was going to go climb Mount Everest. This dude's in his 20s and has accomplished more and pushed himself in ways that I don't think most people are comfortable doing so at any age in their life. So let's just get into it. Episode number 302, I believe it is, with Tyler Carnivale. Enjoy. Okay, got the red smoke. Gun run! North and south! West of the smoke! West of the smoke! Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I made it. Michelle, you ready? Already. How ready are you, though? Uh, I would say like 85%. Remember that one time where I fucking beat your ass, which was earlier today in jiu-jitsu? Actually, it was yesterday. You weren't there. Where were you today? I was helping my dad. We were laying concrete forms. Pipe. Just laying some pipe. Laying pipe, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) Laying pipe. (laughs) Holy shit. Tyler, where should we begin? Wherever you want. Um, you have lived more in this last year of your life than I think most people ever will. Maybe. Yeah, I th- think so. I optimized for it. So You optimized for it. Well, so we met in one of the most uncommon places, I think, on the face of planet Earth. Yes, yeah, that is true. Uh, Antarctica back in – I actually struggled to believe that was this year. <laughs> That's pretty crazy. It, it feels seems like, like years ago. It does seem like yeah. it was years ago, but it was early – Holy shit, it was right after New Year's Eve because we spent yep. New Year's Eve in Punta Arenas. Or we did, at least. I think you were already out we were on the, the ice. mountain, yeah. We were at uh, Low Camp of Vincent and then came back to Union Glacier maybe a week after that. Talk me through what you guys were actually up to. I know, and so for people who are unfamiliar with the geography of Afghanistan, or I was about to say Afghanistan, <laughs> this is not in Afghanistan. Mount Vincent is in Antarctica. Tallest mountain in Antarctica proper? Yes. Okay. Yeah, just over 16,000 feet. Talk me through the plan there. How'd you guys end up there? Why were you guys there? Yeah, so um, my buddy Devin, who you met down there, yep. uh, him and I- I call him, him Let's Go, because yeah. he says that too much. <laughs> yeah, a little bit too much. <laughs> um, him and I met through a mutual friend, a buddy I met in New York years prior, uh, uh, my first job out of school. He said, you guys do a lot of the same stuff. Your timelines are kind of aligned. I want to introduce you. So Devin and I met. We hit it off. Devin's like, hey, I'm going to Mount Vincent. Um, you should come. And I thought it would be great. Um, it was on my bucket list, didn't have any plans to do it, but he said, I'm doing it, come. And I thought, you know what, I'm, I was at SpaceX at the time uh, in their Starlink program. Had these awesome uh, antennas that allow you to receive uh, internet anywhere in the world. I was like, this would be an awesome way to, uh, to show the capabilities of the, the technology. So I wanted to bring one down um, and see if we could get one to the top of Mount Vincent and 
um, use use it and live stream, which we did. Uh, so that which was is kinda... fucking ridiculous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> did uh, old Mister Muskie have to push some satellites down south? Because I was on the beta Starlink test up here. Okay. First off, I got fucking complaints. All right, you don't work there anymore, <laughs> so I got complaints. One, let's hear them. I was on that goddamn beta list for like eight months. Yeah, yeah. Before think... <laughs> it actually showed up, and then one day, randomly, it's like, oh shit, your gear shipped. Awesome. Yeah. But it was my understanding it was mostly mostly northern latitudes working its way down. Yeah, yeah. The, well, the northern it, there's a, there was basically this band uh, maybe between right where Mexico begins under Texas under yeah. Texas to the top of the continental U.S. That Which was, is nowhere near Antarctica. Exactly. That was <laughs> <laughs> covered since the very early days. Yeah. That's where most of our satellites uh, live, orbit, and then the polar orbits had just um, started providing coverage maybe a month before Antarctica. So it was perfect. You have to put, there's basically two orbits. There's the equatorial orbits and then the polar orbits and polar orbits are much harder to get the satellites into. So, um, you know, we put a few in there. This was years after our initial launches or initial satellite launches. And then, um, yeah, totally different planes and yeah, month, month or two before Antarctica. So that is going to revolutionize the experience down there. Oh yeah. I mean, for better or for worse, like uh, I actually think there's an argument for both. Yeah, yep, I agree. Because ALE, for the McDowell, you know, I know he's one of the partners, but holy shit, <laughs> what a setup! And we only experienced the one that was right there. I guess if they would call it the main camp yep. on the Union Glacier, but amazing sleeping. Yep. I mean, it's a tent, but it's a nice tent, double walled, huge sleeping bag, room in between, chow hall, mm -hmm. library. Um, what am I forgetting here? It's Gift shop, nice. yeah. bathrooms, showers, sat phone, airplanes, <laughs> world class like National Geographic level photographers doing classes yeah, at night, just casually hanging out. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't suck. It does not suck. But yeah. you are detached from the rest of the world, which is awesome. Awesome, yeah. That's part of the reason I think people go down there is to detach, get away. Until that evening that I met you and you said, give me your phone. And I don't, you put it in there and the next thing I was like, ding, ding. I was like, fuck. <laughs> I guess it was one of the first to ask me. You're like, hey, uh, can I get connected? I'm like, sure. Yeah. I was, I was like, I, I heard you're the guy. I need to check my email. No, I think trips like that where you're actually off the grid are unbelievable. Having said that, the ability – so I have two Starlink kits. I have one on my lake house and a mobile one that I use. I'll be using it all next week hunting. Nice, nice. I choose when to turn it on, though, and that's the beauty of it. But You're always going to be tempted. Full, But you could do full business like video call, even oh, on yeah. the mobile one. Yeah. I mean, upload. I've uploaded YouTube videos. It's pretty gnarly. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. So – why was Devin going down there? Absent, obviously, well, he was not planning on doing the live stream. He was going to go anyway, just, yeah, to, just yeah, yeah. to climb Mount Vincent? Yeah, his expedition had already been planned before I even decided to join. He was just uh, heading down to Vincent as part of his uh, Seven Summits um, project. He wanted to do all Seven Summits, which is the tallest peak on each continent. And yeah, then I just... You know, pulled him into that project, and we kind of made something something out of it. So, so how did your how did your trip go? Did you guys start in Punta Arenas as well, the whole ALE experience, and then Union Glacier? Then you guys pushed out to a different camp, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We started in Punta Arenas. I uh, had a few nights there, and then came over to Union Glacier on the Blue yep. Ice Runway. Uh, immediately, we're shuttled over to Vincent uh, Base Camp, which is maybe a forty five minute flight. One of those uh, ski equipped twin otters. Um, 45 minutes away, slept a night there, and then started our, our climb. And it was about a week. I think they do kind of weekly shuttles in and out of that uh, that base camp over there. How big is that mountain? Just over 16,000 feet. Um, Fuck. So, I mean, not not the tallest in the world, but the atmosphere is stretched at the poles. So you definitely feel the, the altitude a bit more than you would if you were climbing that closer to the equator. And you had that rectangular – it was much thinner. I'm trying to remember. The, the Starlink? actual antenna, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, custom-made when my buddies on the – the hardware team um, put that together just so it was more easily carried. Um, you had the fully integrated Wi-Fi, so the Wi-Fi... It was all inside of that? Yeah. Yep. You all bastard. you do is plug it in. And <laughs> <laughs> so were you guys humping batteries, though? Yeah. And Devin brought this really nice battery down, um, made it from JFK to Santiago, Santiago to Punta Arenas. And then the security personnel in Punta Arenas said, you can't bring this on the plane. And we're like, fuck. And, uh, but sir, how do you think I got it here? Exactly, yeah. <laughs> And that's a rinky-dink little airport. The last thing you think w w would happen is uh, them confiscating it there. So then Wild. Mike McDowell's like, hey, we have um, – I don't know if you remember – oh, you weren't on our plane, but they called us off early. They were like, hey, we have these batteries all lined up. Some of these might work. So we wound up using these uh, lead-acid batteries that in, in the cold – I think they gave us maybe 10 minutes of runtime, if that, and uh, had to haul up these two, probably two, three-pound batteries um, to the top and <laughs> – 
That is so unacceptable for 2023. (laughs) (laughs) Yep. Made it work, though. But you guys live streamed at New Year's Eve 2023, right? We did, yes, from from Low Camp. That is ridiculous. Yeah. And also incredibly awesome. Yeah, pretty cool. I heard your former boss kind of is responsible for one of the camps that's out there, like the super bougie one. That is true, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) They call it uh, Three Glaciers Retreat, but um, we just call it Elon's Camp because apparently he was in Punta Arenas. He had given them somewhere between you know a million or two to build that years prior, and then uh, I think because of weather, Elon's girlfriend at the time said, "Let's let's head out." And then they still built the camp, and they're like, "Hey, I mean, he paid for it. Let's build it." And he still hasn't been down to see it. So I feel like he dodged a bullet with that particular girlfriend. Yeah, yeah I don't I want to so. name any names, <laughs> but if you wanted to watch a documentary about Johnny Depp and his <laughs> girlfriend, I'm just saying there's a Venn diagram overlap. Yes, there. yeah. <laughs> Holy shit, he dodged a bullet. Yes, he did. Oh, yeah. I'm happy for him on that When you hear those details come out in the the Johnny Depp trial, it's... um, Bro. Yeah. (laughs) I didn't want to watch that documentary, but I started, and I couldn't stop. Oh, I'm I'm sure. (laughs) They they did this fascinating... She'd get up and talk about a subject. He would get up. Relatively the same questions, completely polar, diametrically opposed answers to the same question. Oh, yeah. His... uh, He's a straight savage, too. You need to devote about four hours to watching this. His low-level, comedic, sarcastic answers <laughs> so while good. in court that is being broadcast to the world. Yep. Nothing but respect for it. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> it was <laughs> awesome. So then you guys came back to were – were you there with uh, Honold? Was he at the Vincent camp too? Yeah, just completely by chance. He, uh, I saw him in the airport in Puerto Rico, so I was like, holy shit, that's Alex Honold. And then I get on the shuttle thinking I would just see him in the airport, walk away, never see him again. Sitting next to me on the shuttle, I'm like, I guess he's on uh, this expedition. And Did he speak to you at all? Yeah, yeah, right on the bus, just introduced himself. Um, he seems like a quiet man. Quiet, but once you get get to talk, start talking to him, he's super, super kind and uh, down to earth. Um, and I feel like you, you know him as a climber, but then when you start to talk to him, I was calling him Alex the, the philosopher. He has so many thoughts on life and relationships. Really? Yeah, it was pretty interesting. I bet you have, I've never been a big face climber like those guys are, spending extended periods of time on the wall. No, yeah, me neither. I feel like you have some pretty philosophical conversations with yourself. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. But just about life in general while being suspended 4,000 feet up off the ground. Yep. They shit while in their harness hanging off the side of the wall. That's what interests me the most. Is that true? How do you think they shit, man? I mean, yeah, that's... Yeah, one, that's so once point. they get up there, they're never out of their harness. So even when they're in those portal edges, mm-hmm. they're still clipped in. So you're sleeping in your harness in case that portal edge were to fail, which statistically they don't very often, mm-hmm. but they do. They do, yeah. Every now, now and then. Yeah, which would be utterly and ungodly terrifying. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I would retire from climbing right after that, <laughs> assuming that I didn't retire in the course of the fall to the impact on the ground. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, think about that. They have to shit while hooked in. Yeah. The yeah. logistics involved. That'll spark some philosophical conversations with oneself. I guess the rule is in uh, Yosemite at El Cap, is you pick up a few, so they shit into paper bags or plastic bags and they just throw it. So <laughs> I, I had no you, idea. I did not know this. I know. This is what the show's about. It's educational. So <laughs> apparently the, like, the unspoken rule is as you're walking up, you scoop up a few bags and throw them away Okay. so that others will do the same thing to you as you throw your shit off as you're climbing the wall. Okay. So it's really all I have to offer from an educational perspective <laughs> today. I mean, I learned something. That was, uh, yeah. Antarctica was... The most eclectic group of people that I – I was – I didn't know what to expect, and I actually had put no thought into the type of person that we were going to meet there because we were so concerned with the logistics. I'll leave all the names out of it, but like incredibly high net worth individuals, yes. right, from like oh, the yeah. investment background, doctors, lawyers. Well, the barrier to entry to get there from a price perspective is not cheap. So that kind of – that separates a little bit of the wheat from the chaff there. Mm-hmm. But it was pretty wild, Yeah, the group of people <laughs> that was there. Yeah, I say this all the time. It was the uh, most eclectic group of people I've ever, yeah. I've ever been around. We still keep in contact, or I don't, but uh, a couple of people on the 777 keep in contact. I'm trying to think. Uh, this With the guy you went to uh, Everest with, we'll leave it at that. So I don't yeah. know if he likes to have his name out there or not. But yeah, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so either. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was wild. Yeah, because you guys came back. Mm-hmm. I don't think we had done our first jump yet. Because I know you guys were at the DZ. Yeah, that was a few days before the first jump. Yeah. But it was like every, every person you talked to was more interesting than the last. It was the craziest thing. You couldn't find a boring person there. No, you could not. And after a couple of glasses of wine, which was nice, I had wine down yeah. there, you start talking to people and you hear their stories. It's unbelievable. I thought I was a loser after that trip. 
I sat down <laughs> with Mike McDowell for almost four hours. Oh, that's easy to do. That guy has stories. Like- it, well, unfortunately, it was the night. It was the day after we we had been sitting in the food tent, and he's just talking about being part of a submarine company with, you know, uh, fucking the guy who directed the Titanic. Cameron. Oh yeah, yeah, James Cameron. Being one of the first people to see the Bismarck, going down to Titanic, being at the Marianas Trench, working as a scientist with Emperor. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? Yep. And he's just, oh, yes. And then this one time, with his, I can't even do an Australian accent. So I said, hey, I, I wish I had put a microphone out that night. Oh, yeah. Because we sat down for so four hours and scratched the surface. Yep. Yep. Sure the could be weeks, he's been weeks into. of stories. Yeah. <laughs> just sit down and listen for weeks. I mean, unbelievable. Yeah. And the fact that he is still like into it, yeah, he, remi- think- he reminds me of one of those like old timey explorers, like the uh, Shackletons of the world. Like uh, he would a hundred percent been on Shackleton's yes, boat. Yeah, hundred percent. Like seal fur thong, just yep. up there up front, <laughs> just like looking. Yep. Yeah. He God, that place was crazy. He was telling us he, he was over in South America when he was a teenager, which was probably maybe fifties or sixties, backpacking around uh, South America before it was even yeah. You know, there was any infrastructure. Unbelievable stories. Just. Do you Another, have any kids? I do not, no. When you do have kids, yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, when they get to that <clears> age of being a teenager, run that thought exercise through your mind of just, yeah, just go hike on your own. <laughs> you, you'd be like, no, absolutely not. Not in the world that we live in. That My daughter just got her driver's license. That scares me enough. Yeah. <laughs> She's out. We're all a little bit less safe right mm-hmm. now because she has her license, but I cannot even fathom. It had to be such a huge cultural shift. Just, yeah, go ahead. Go do a summer oh, yeah. abroad yeah. or a year abroad. Yep. Yeah, he talked about backpacking all over the world. It was uh, one of the most interesting conversations that I've ever had. Yeah, I would agree. And I had to stop because I literally was out of space on the SIM card. <laughs> <laughs> like, sorry, dude. <laughs> so you guys, yeah, you guys came in before we did the jump. Mm-hmm. We did that jump that one day. You guys were all sitting there. Which was awesome, by the way. Watching that from the ground, unbelievable. Yeah, but then you got thrown into tandem harness. No, I, I actually didn't. Oh, uh, I some others did. No, no, no. Oh, I thought uh, you had I, a chance to jump because I know we took Mike. And yeah, by Mike, we, Mike I mean went. Nick did. <laughs> uh, I think we had the offer. I forget why why we didn't do it, but yeah, I wish we had. You should have. I got to go back down now. Do oh, you think you will? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think um, high chance to go in November. Um, we'll see if the the schedule works or if it allows for it. But um, I want to do the South Pole. So, as in trekking to the South Pole? Yeah, yeah. Last degree. Where do they drop you off for that? Is it? It's like 160 miles, something like that. Actually, not sure, but I think so. Yeah, something somewhere around there. Uh, there were a large number of groups that were doing that. I think they fly you in to the last degree. Yes. Yep. And I think it's yeah, it's man powered with the sleds behind you. Yep. Yep. And I, I'm not sure where they drop you off, but yeah, it's about uh, yeah 160 miles or so away, and then yeah, you're skiing all the way uh, to the South Pole after that. Then they'll pick you up from there, bring you back. And I'm not sure if you guys had already left, but uh, a crew who had just got back from doing that came in. I think I think you had. Had we might have all been on the same flight out, actually. Maybe, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Because you guys came back from Vincent, obviously, probably just waiting for the next rotator flight that flew out of there on the Blue Ice Runway. Yep. Yeah, yeah. we were all on the same flight out then. Okay. And then from there, we all departed. Yeah, damn it. I thought we had taken you for a tandem. Oh, I wish. I had asked Mike. I thought there were a large number of people who had jumped in Antarctica. He mm-hmm. thinks it's less than 25. Really? Yeah. Holy shit. Well, three of them on one load in the late 90s, decided mm. not to pull their parachutes, so. Why? What happened there? They impacted the ground at a high rate of speed. Yeah, but all three of them? Yes. What uh, What happened? So it's very white. Yes. It and disorienting. So people have a, di- uh, everybody has their own philosophy and approach when it comes to skydiving. Mm-hmm. I have a ditter in each year, so it is an audible, you can do a lot of things. Some of them are like law books, but essentially it beeps at certain altitudes. Okay. So you can set them at whatever, and you can set them at whatever you want. And mm-hmm. there's beeps for when you're in free fall, like, hey, you're getting to deployment, or if you're with a group, it's time to break off and create lateral separation. Another beep for deployment altitude. And then on high performance canopies, you can set up beeps so you know when to be in your landing pattern, when to start a turn, all of those things. So mm-hmm. it's just, it's a reminder. You don't need them. Because there's uh, visual altimeters as well. Mm -hmm. So I had a visual altimeter on, two ditters. And you're also jumping with other people that hopefully also have awareness in the air. It's like, oh, Bob's deploying his parachute. Maybe there's a reason for that. I should do so. (laughs) So I guess this group went out and they got fixated into coming in. And I think they had grips, which my wife 
makes fun of. She's like, oh, it's so cute. You guys are holding hands. I'm like, <laughs> how else are we supposed to hold on to each other? Lost altitude awareness hmm. and burned into the ice. Wow. Yeah. I believe. It was uh, rough. Well, they also penetrated the ice a little bit. Wow. Imagine searching for a body that just kind of made a hole. Yep. That is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so That's I think tough. there was five jumpers. Michael, you could probably Google this. Yeah, th- I'm already. And, and three of them. Impact. Three of them burned in. Okay. Yeah. Very, very close to each other, meaning they had not even realized mm-hmm. or just barely realized. The people that survived, yeah, the people that survived, there's a computer that you can attach to your reserve. Yeah. It will fire it at a certain speed and altitude and barometric pressure metric, and that's what saved the people's lives. And when that happens, you have a very, very short canopy mm-hmm. ride because it happens very low. And why didn't these guys have that? I think they did. They might not have turned them on. Mm. It's not an automatic on. So okay. This is just a wall of text, so it's kind of annoying, but. We got, they got out. Yep. Scroll down a little bit more. We're embarking. First tandem jump. Oh, God. Hopefully they survived. Yep. Okay. Scroll down. Okay. So things went awry. The foursome hoped to link up in formation in free fall, track away from each other, and open their chutes at 3,500 feet. Mm-hmm. So after several failed attempts to hook up, <laughs> one of them realized they'd already dropped below 2,000 feet. So he tracked oh, away God. and reached for his ripcord as he did his AAD, which is set to fire at 750 feet, <laughs> fired off. Yep. Everybody else, not so much. That is, that is rough. You would think, knowing that the Earth, if you want to continue skydiving, you need to deploy a parachute and yeah. that the Earth is constantly there. Yep. <laughs> And I don't know your thoughts on this. I personally believe that it's round. I had some people ask me oh, about the, did you see an ice wall in Antarctica that separated? I was told I'm not allowed to talk about it. So. Oh, fuck. They made you sign that NDA? <laughs> yeah. I chose yep. not to, so I can say what I want. <laughs> <laughs> but it's real. You're, you'll be in free fall and you will be so focused on, because you'll plan a dive, mm-hmm. go out. You'll get so focused on trying to accomplish it yep. that you'll look down at your altimeter and go, fuck. And you can get lower than you want, and those guys sucked it straight in. Yeah, that's uh, not fun. I've been a few times, tandem, just yeah. uh, up in New Jersey where I'm from, but I can only imagine the, the responsibility you have when you're jumping solo. And It's not even that much. Yeah, but it's like step one, save your own life. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of responsibility in a way. Step two, don't forget step one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, And yep. again, all those other the beeps and all that stuff can help you remember to do those things. Mm-hmm. But it's much like a seatbelt on a car. If you don't put it on and you so, go through the windshield, yeah. whose fault is that? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> That's a good analogy. Yeah. It's basically what it is. If you don't turn your Cypress, which is one of multiple uh, brands, if you don't turn it on, it's not going to do shit for you. Mm. But imagine being found dead with an automatic activation device it's on your reserve. Yeah. It's off. Yeah. It's pretty embarrassing. <laughs> Poor form. Yeah. <laughs> so so how, that, how many I, jumps have you done? Just uh, About 8,500. Holy shit. I've been at it wow. for a long time. Okay. I've been at it for a long time. Um, and that's actually not a high amount of numbers. Like your buddy- That's not a high amount. We, your buddy, we were talking about Jeffro, yeah. the guy from the yeah. ranch. He's probably got, I bet you somewhere between thirty to 40,000. Holy shit. He does it professionally. Yeah. I was a hobbyist. I, I am a hobbyist and have been for years. Mm-hmm. People who work in the sport will crank out 1,000 to 3,000 jumps just every year. <laughs> that, is, that is wild. It is wild. They don't often accomplish much more in life, mm. but it's, you know, they're good at free fall. Yeah. So- Sure, it's fun. All right. So we were, we did our jump. We all came back. We continued on the 777. You guys were already talking about Everest at that point. Yeah. Dude, tell the tale of Everest. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's kind of why Devin and I were linked up in the first place. Did he go to Everest too? He was supposed to. And uh, just due to a few different things, wasn't able to this season. I think he's going to try to do it next year, in which case I'll probably join him. So without oxygen this time, though. Maybe. I mean, yeah, that would be a challenge. It would be, it would be dumb to do it again with oxygen, know what to expect, have it all. I don't think it would be dumb to do it again with <laughs> oxygen. Have you not seen the videos of the bodies sliding down the hill? Yeah, I saw that. And I, I, hill, I, I, I saw bodies in person, too, which was well, surreal. Yeah. Surreal. Well, don't they use them as landmarks? They do, yeah. Yeah, yeah. wild. So I think Green Boots is one of them. They'll mention, hey, Green Boots, make yeah. a left. Um, that was surreal. I mean, you, you think you can be prepared for it, but seeing these frozen, perfectly preserved bodies just kind of looking up at the sky, just uh, something else. For whatever reason, um, the past few months, it seems like there's been an emphasis on stories of people walking past climbers in duress. Mm. 
interesting articles, but damn, that's a tough conversation. I don't think people understand how limited your capacity is at that altitude. Having said that, I've never been there. Mm. I've been that I've been that high free fall wise, mm-hmm. but never exerting myself actually foot climbing up there. Mm. I mean, there's also a lot of stories of people who died in the attempt of helping other people that were in duress. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Once you're above eight thousand meters, which is uh what they call the death death zone, where your body's actively dying from the lack of oxygen. Um, every small exertion is um, just, you get tired. You get very, very tired. Um, How'd you train for it? Ooh, that's an interesting <laughs> question. I, I didn't <laughs> I didn't really train. Um, okay. Just, so just, far, I like this. <laughs> <laughs> kept myself in generally good shape. Um, and I feel like when, when I try to train or prepare for something too much, I kind of psych myself out. It's almost not worth it. It's better to just hop in and... Um, I almost enjoy trying to find a way to get through something tough without much training. Um, of course, being in good shape is helpful. And I'd done a couple of climbs that were up to maybe 20, 21,000 feet um, in Ecuador a few years back. So I knew kind of what to expect with the with regard to the lack of oxygen. Um, but that was another world up there once you're above 8,000 meters. And um, yeah, actually, we I don't know if you saw the video. There were a few, I think, that came out this year of people trying to help people off. Yeah. Uh, near the summit, Nims, uh, Nims Persia, famous Nepali mountaineer. Um, he was our expedition leader this year. He actually saved a guy. It was the highest altitude um, uh, rescue in history. Um, Wasn't he in Antarctica as well? Not the year we were down there. Um, I think maybe the previous season. He okay. was doing um, the South Pole. and Those guys are fucking legends. They are. Oh, they're legends. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I actually don't know how to describe it other than that. He's uh, he's a national hero. He's like when you're over in Nepal and people see him out in the streets, it's like they're seeing Messi. Um, really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Really, really good guy. Outspoken. He definitely is controversial, but um, amazing what they can do. I mean, I I get out of the tent at Camp Four, which is just around eight thousand meters, and I'm dying. I mean, you can see it in my face. He looks like he just woke up and freshly showered and perfect and full of energy. It's pretty insane. How did so? Talk me to how you even get to camp for because obviously there's three two one all that stuff yep. Where, how, your travel over there like break down the whole thing where'd you start from yeah so you, you come to nepal you expect to spend maybe somewhere between six to eight weeks in the country um in total um flying to Kathmandu, and then from Kathmandu, you will take a helicopter or plane to lukla which is the first kind of beginning uh town on the trek that brings you up to base camp um i think it's most dangerous runway in the world by the way um it's like super short, so you can. And it's it doesn't have like this. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, exactly. A little bend, a lot yep. like Michael's dick. I've been told. <laughs> and it uh, angles right up at the mountainside to try to slow you down. Flying to there, then for most people, you'll do a, a trek from Lukla through all these mountain towns up to base camp, which is about a week long. Um, it's good for acclimatization as well. Uh, get up to base camp, and then from base camp, you do an acclimatization rotation. So from base camp, you go up to camp one, spend a night. Up to camp two, which is around maybe seventeen, no, maybe yeah, seventeen, eighteen thousand feet. Spend a couple nights up there, um, and then come back down. Wait another two weeks or so for the right weather window, which is usually at the end of May, maybe first week of June, um, and then head up from base camp to camp one. Uh, on the summit push, you actually skip past camp one. Don't even spend a night there. Get to camp two. You just walk right past it. Walk right past it, which is uh, demoralizing a bit. You're like, Fuck. Uh, head up to camp two, spend a night. Camp three, spend a night. Camp four, spend a night. And then you wake up at like 2 a.m. or so and go for the summit push. How big are these camps? Uh, camp two, base camp is huge. Thousands of people. Camp two. Thousands. Yeah, thousands. Holy um, shit. Does yeah. it, is that sit year round or are they rebuild it every year? Uh, for the most part, for the most part, it is built, rebuilt every year. Um, I think they leave some infrastructure, but for the most part, all those tents are taken down at the end of the season and put back up. Um, very the, ALE-ish. Yeah, yeah, very ALE-ish. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's interesting. It's like a little town. You have each expedition group uh, with their own kind of little um, area, and then you have this one trail that winds through, gives you access to all those areas. Um, Thousands of people there because you have people who are coming up for time at base camp who aren't going to go climb. Then you obviously have the mountaineers who are going to summit. Just to hang out at base camp? Just to hang out at base camp. I That's mean, a thing? Yeah. A lot of people want to do that hike from Lukla all the way up to base camp. and It's got to be a breathtaking Unbelievable. Hike. One of the most beautiful hikes I've ever been on in my life. I mean, you're, you're hiking through the heart of the Himalayas. Um, you can see Everest, Lhotse, 
uh, all of these beautiful peaks. Um, it's one of those places where you could take any picture you wanted to, and it's it's yeah, no. it's two percent of what it looks like in person. Yeah, exactly. God Don't do it justice. Damn, man. Okay, so there's people who just go to base camp. Yeah, I can support that. Yeah, then camp, camp two, a little bit smaller, maybe think a few hundred people. That's like kind of the the bigger camp on the mountain. Um, and then camp four, everyone kind of congregates up there, waiting for the right weather window. And uh, oh yeah, there's a there's a good uh, oh, sweet diagram. Um, everyone kind of congregates up there, waiting for the right day to, to summit. And um, this was a record year. I think the government gave out 480 permits to, to climb, so you get you know somewhere around 400 plus people at camp four at once. Um, I don't know shit about climbing, but that sounds problematic to me. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there's trash everywhere, um, which is Did bad. Did you consider sabotage at all? <laughs> I mean, we could we could trim down these numbers. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. You I don't know where your oxygen went, sir. <laughs> oh, you don't have the right gear to get to the summit? Get out of my way, I do. <laughs> we, we were lucky because Nims is uh, a fucking legend. He's a fucking legend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's uh, <laughs> he's willing to take risks. And we went up in some gnarly weather. It was like negative sixty Fahrenheit with wind chill. Oh my god! Eighty mile per hour winds at the top. So it was just thirty of us on the summit push. But the next day, my buddy went the next day. Uh, he was in a queue of two hundred fifty people. So you're waiting. We we summited in eight or nine hours. They were like fifteen, sixteen hours just because of the line. I can't even fathom. I've seen those pictures, and yeah. actually. Right or wrong, I don't know the answer to that. There's a lot of criticism from people who, first off, never would have the stones yeah. to go up there and attempt it. <laughs> Michael, you threw that image back up there, you son of a bitch. You know, talking about that cue, but I can't, I can't even f- fathom being stuck in the middle of that. Oh yeah, no. and only being able to move when the person in front of you moves, yep. and having no control, and you're on an oxygen bottle. Yep. I don't, man, that is not an experience I would want. So you guys were able to do that with 30 people. Yeah. Because, I mean, conditions weren't ideal, and Nims is like, fuck it, we're going. Um, Pros and cons to that approach as well. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> it was fun. It makes for a good story. But when you're uh, in the moment up there, yeah. it's like, fuck. It's just, um, I, I like to think that I'm, I can handle a lot, but that was, that was a lot. That'll push you to the edge, for there, sure. There, there is one ledge up by, uh, right around that second step mark that is this wide, no more than maybe a foot at most, and you are... You are latched onto this safety rope with a carabiner. That's it. I connected your harness. And the wind's pushing your body like to the point where you are swinging side to side. And it's just it's a lot. Yeah. And then people who are coming down, they have to unclip and clip on the other side of you to, to get around you. It's, it's gnarly. Do you do it like U.S. driving rules? Guy on the right has the right of way? How do we do, how, how are we doing this here? Just depends. <laughs> it's uh, because depend- that'd be fucked up if some British dude came down. He's like, "Get out of my way!" Oh yeah, like trying to go the reverse. Like that's not going to work. It's uh, it's usually people coming down have the right of way, just because um, because they're going to die. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, the, the long, the, the more time you spend up there, over eight thousand meters, the the riskier it is. So you just want to sure. let people coming down um, get down as quickly as they can. All right. So there's the base camp. You're working your way up. So you said you skip camp one. When you're getting ready to, for the right? sun push, and what are you guys doing there? You're not hiking every day, or are you? Are you just trying to stay active to increase the red blood cell count at, at base camp? Yeah, or yeah. just the whole time? Because you're, other than the summit push, there's, an, I mean, six to eight weeks is a good amount of time. Six, so let's let's say it was eight weeks. Six yeah. of those weeks is sedentary. You're just sitting around waiting, waiting, um, doing some training in the Kumbu Icefall, which is actually yeah. the most dangerous part. But uh, aside from that, yeah, you're sitting. That's why, in terms of physical training, I was like, it's not really worth it because any anything that you're going to gain is going to be lost in the, the waiting time. I guess that makes sense, but you took a Stairmaster to the top of Mount Everest, and that <laughs> is a little exhausting on the old hammies and quads. Yeah. Old hammies. <laughs> <laughs> it was exhausting. I, I bet. Lost at least like 10 pounds. It's pretty crazy. So you pass Camp 1. You yes. go, and so you, you step... Uh, stop at Camp 2 when you're going for the summit push? Yes. Spend a night there. And then push to Camp 3? Mm-hmm. I'm assuming you're doing this in daylight hours. In daylight hours, yeah. Okay. Yep. Push to Camp 3, then Camp 4. Yep. And then you're waking up in the middle of the night or you know early morning. Yeah, like 1, one 2 a.m. And you just send it. Yeah, just send it. And it's the last fucking thing you ever want to do. Wake, I was going to say, up. how are you feeling at that point? Because you're sleeping with an oxygen mask on as well, right? You you're are. Basically, you are. Which is which is shit because you know it's uh, not fun to be tossing and turning with this huge thing, uh, huge thing on your mouth. You, are you trying to say you did not sleep well? I did not sleep well. No. What's the problem? <laughs> Should have been exhausted from your stair climber. Yeah, it's it's, it's freezing. Um, your body's consuming itself. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and uh, 
absolutely starving, and then you get there and you realize that the Nepali guys you're with love chicken feet that have been pickled, and that's all the food you have. So that's not acceptable. Uh, yeah, totally not acceptable. Have you never heard of beef jerky? Put that <laughs> shit in your backpack. I think I think uh, the, the final night before the summit push, when I was the absolute hungriest and and just feeling like shit, was ramen with with chicken feet in it. I'm actually surprised you had an appetite at that altitude with that workload. It was diminished. Yeah, I, I barely barely felt hunger, um, but I did. I did as soon as I started to smell them them cooking. I did. I started to get pretty hungry. And these camps are pre set up for you, so you show up and you're just boom. Yes. Go. Although this year, Camp Four, since we were up there a little bit early, nothing was set up, and the winds were ripping. So we were in uh, a tent that had been up there for maybe a week prior, just ripping in the wind uh waiting for them to set up the tents for our group um so how bad is the trash it's bad it is bad i thought it was exaggerated but uh no just tents from uh seasons prior everywhere ripped up trash everywhere um ox- oxygen canisters just lying around empty which is dangerous too because uh, between camp three and camp four there's what they call the lotse face which is just this almost vertical uh blue ice wall that you're you kind of have to kick your crampons into and get up um and there's some rock fall which is dangerous but then you have oxygen canisters flying down the side of that shut the fuck up yeah oh yeah yeah and i, I, I was oh, that would not be the way to go <laughs> no, just no. get domed by an o2 canister it, it would it would be instant death yeah <laughs> My buddy took a rock to his uh, his rib cage when he was climbing up, and he said that definitely bru- at least bruised a rib, maybe broke it. I don't think he. Oh, probably felt like hit- it was a shotgun. Yeah. Yep. God damn. And again, I'm not saying you're an expert on Everest, but is it just because they're so shattered at those altitudes they don't have the energy to clean the stuff up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's it's just not worth it. I mean, you you want to conserve every ounce of energy you have for your own climb. Um, people say once you're above camp four, you, even though you're with a group, you're really alone because if anything goes wrong, for the most part, you're not going to be able to get rescued. It's you, um, alone up there. And how do they brief that to you? Uh, I mean, I'm sure Nims' style is a bit different than how other people would approach it. But when we're at base camp ready for the summit push, he basically says, look, this is no joke. Um, don't fuck around, be very disciplined. I can't stress that enough. And, uh, once you're up there, like he essentially says, you are alone. You have to make sure you do everything right. Hear what I say. Um, follow my instruction. And yeah, I mean. So if, let's say somebody in your group, they understand that. They acknowledge it. They send it. They get, get close to the summit, but they make the decision to turn around. Are they on their own to navigate the way back down? Uh, you will typically have someone from the expedition bring you down. So okay. like one of the, there's a ton of guides and, and Sherpas. One of them will, will bring you down. Fuck, man, that is wild. Yep. An individual team effort. Yep, yep. What, uh, where in that did you encounter the first uh, frozen climber body? Um, maybe like a few hours into climbing from Camp 4. Uh, once you get to like that first step area, you'll start seeing bodies. Um, Green Boots is right there, the famous one from, I think, the ni- 80s or early 90s. Um, just kind of frozen on his side. Um, saw another one right below the summit, which was, I think, the most surreal one because it's just sitting there looking up at the sky and you're thinking to yourself as you're I've, I don't think I've ever been more tired in my life you're thinking to yourself this person was just as motivated and as, as ambitious as I was and uh, look what happened to them and you're looking up at the summit you're like is this worth it were those That's the fun. first dead bodies you've seen yeah yeah they were it's a little I mean, wild it is it to is encounter that on a mountain like that yes I mean I've seen bodies at funerals like wakes yeah. um, but not like that yeah. yeah no that's out in the wild yes out in the wild yeah <laughs> Super surreal. God, how insane is that? They use, I mean, it's a savage activity to begin with. Like, yeah. you either, you're built, you're built a little bit differently if you want to pursue these type of things. Like to me, the thought of Everest, like it's fuck yeah for sure. Yeah. Like, yeah. I get that yeah, you would love it. Yeah, I mean, for I also understand people going, "What in the actual fuck is wrong with you, Tyler?" <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Because my parents, my friends, <laughs> <laughs> my how, poor mom. <laughs> What did they say to you when you came home and, or not necessarily came home, but hey, mom and dad, <laughs> I have an idea for something I want to do. What was their response? I think I think they're numb to it now because this has been like years of <laughs> endless. Everest is a little bit of a different story, though. Yeah, yeah, but I think I, I actually think uh, I did this row. I don't know if I ever told you about this a, a row, which I think um, your buddy Mike he's about to do something similar down in the uh, the um, Southern Ocean. Did a row from Svalbard, this Norwegian archipelago, up by the polar ice cap, up to the polar ice cap, and down to Jan Mayen, so the island north of Iceland. 
Um, and I, I actually think that was the only thing I've done more dangerous than Everest. Um, yeah. And that was when I was 23. So my mom lost her shit then. And since then, I've done crazy stuff. And I feel like Everest was, she's numb to it now. Well, it would be hard to top that. Yeah. yeah I don't I mean, maybe. What do you have left on your bucket list? I want to go to space. That is for sure. Well, you just fucked up because you <laughs> left a company that has that in the name. Yeah, although when I <laughs> when I left, one of my uh, good friends there, um, Jonathan Hoffelers, he's uh, one of the vice presidents. He's been there for 15, 16 years now. He was like, I know you'll be back when the time is right for you to, to head up. Um, so I, I didn't burn any bridges still. Some of my best friends over there. So yeah. I think hopefully I'll make that happen. We'll get to, we'll get to old SpaceX because I have questions <laughs> about old fucking musky. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, so... You get to the final camp. You're like, oh, I'll just rest in this tent that's being whipped around in my yeah. oxygen. Are you? I'm assuming you're just. It's not even whether or not you are cold. It's just different versions of being cold at that point. Yeah. Um, yeah. People. People have asked me what uh, the hardest aspect of the climb was, and the physical aspect wasn't even in the top five. And I think the the cold uh, was the, was the number one hardest part of it because just you w- impossible to maintain worth. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, like Antarctica was cold, um, but for some reason this was just different because you are. Vincent was a tough climb, but this was a lot more physical exertion. You're you're sweating a lot more, and when that starts to cool down and you feel freezing, you get in your sleeping bag, um, get a little warm, and then waking up at five a.m. and like negative thirty, negative forty, trying to find the motivation to get out. It's just tough, man. Um, really, really cold and. Just exhausting. Like the lack of oxygen, it's it's really hard to understand how exhausting that is until you're in it. Like even before, before this, I thought I knew what to expect. No, it's just, it's tough. Did they ever throw a pulse ox on your finger at those altitudes? I'm curious what the O2 sat would be. At uh, at base camp, yeah. When, when I first got up there, I think it was somewhere around 80. And then after a few... That's not good. No, it's not good. No, no, no. <laughs> I was a little worried. That's not good at all. <laughs> that in the U.S. is... Um, Hey, get in the back of this ambulance yeah. <laughs> <laughs> with the O2 on your face. Yeah, that was uh, that was when we first got up there. And then I think a few days before we went up for Summit Push, it was high 90s. So it felt better. That's better. Well, you got more red blood cells yes. at that point. Yep. So talk me through the Summit Day. Yeah, woke up, uh, heard heard a little uh, rattling at the, the tent. Um, it was Nims. He's like, get up, we're going. We're going to the top. And... <laughs> Like, fuck. And um, when you say the weather was questionable, what are we talking about here? 70, 80 mile per hour winds just ripping at the tent um, to the point where your body is, there's nothing you can do to not be, you know, swayed, pushed over. And then up at the top, negative 50, negative 60 Fahrenheit with wind chill. Uh, The coldest I've ever felt in my life. Um, My mask froze to my face. To the point where when I when I took it off, I felt skin rip off with it from the, the frozen condensation in there. Um, but yeah, he, he pulls us out. I think it's like 1.30 a.m. around there. You have to get up. It's beautiful. I mean, the stars are amazing. It's um, just otherworldly. But you have to get up, put all your gear on with freezing fingers, uh, get your boots on, crampons, everything, and then you just start heading up. And Under headlamps? Yeah, just headlamps. And you are looking up at this behemoth, seeing headlamps from people who had started maybe an hour or two earlier, and you're like, <laughs> Jesus. And uh, Like, you fucking crazy <laughs> bastards. So start heading up, and sun starts rising, and you're like, okay, this is a little bit better. It's going to warm up a little bit. Didn't really. Um, then you navigate your way up, and you start seeing landmarks that you'd only ever read about, which is pretty cool. Um, but once you're maybe... Half a mile from the top, you're just exhausted and you just keep pushing on. It's almost you reach this meditative state where your brain is, um, you know, no thoughts and just make it up. And I expected the summit to be euphoric and kind of like one of those moments where it's like, oh my God, but you're so dead at that point where it doesn't really hit you until you're back down um, and have some time to rest. But um, when in that summit push day did you start having hope that you guys were going to make it? Uh, I think right where. Let me see. Right around that second step mark on the map. Is that near the Hillary? Or the Hillary step is just below the summit. Group. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Just below the summit. I, yeah. I would say Hillary step is where, you know, you start to realize that the summit's right there. You get, a, you almost get excited. So you get like a little burst of energy and yeah. How long did you spend up there? 
From Camp 4 up to the top was, the whole thing was about, I think, nine hours. And at the summit itself, we spent 15, 20 minutes. I mean, it was freezing to the point where I wanted to stay longer, but it would have been too Catastrophic. Much. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. How was the way down? It was easier. Um, I mean, I was more tired, but it was just, you kind of tell yourself with each step, there's more oxygen, you're going to feel better. So, um, and it's easier. It's less physical exertion. Yeah. You're, 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 you have to stop yourself. It's a, it's a lot on the legs, but uh, it was good. I think it took us yeah, maybe just over six hours to get to the top and then like just over two hours to come down. So, Do you spend a night at Camp 4 after summoning? No, you spend maybe two to three hours just resting and then you start making your way back down to Camp 3. Because okay. the less time you spend, the high, the better. The yeah, better. for sure. Yeah. And where's the uh, where is the old eight thousand meter mark there? Uh, is it probably between Camp Four and Camp Three? Uh, I think it's actually just over Camp Four, but okay. people usually just say Camp Four is it. Okay. So you can see that twenty seven thousand two hundred feet. Yeah. Mark. God damn. It was pretty amazing. And then the trek, slow trek back down to base camp. I mean, after you summit, is there really any? emphasis or impetus to move quickly or is it kind of just go at your own pace till you get back down there go at your own pace i actually wound up spending a an extra night at camp two just to recover a little bit more um because my my legs were dead i just wanted to there was no reason to rush back down yeah. i mean we weren't going to get um out from base camp for another few days so why why push it um but when you go through the kumbu icefall which is between two and one uh, or sorry, one in uh, base camp, you want to make sure you're moving fast through that because on your way down, you're in direct sunlight. It's like around noon, 1 p.m. And those giant blocks of ice are actually slowly moving and the ice becomes more unstable as it gets warmer during the day. So, You were saying that's actually the most dangerous portion of the climb? Yes. Is that ice fall? Yeah, by far. That's where, you know, just unexpectedly a, a massive multi-hundred ton uh, thing of ice can just fall and, and bring you down with it. Wow. Um, I think three Sherpas died by falling into one of those crevasses there uh, a couple days before we went up for our climatization rotation. Fuck, man. And um, yeah, it's no joke. It's How pretty... many people summited? For, uh, from our group, I think it was 100%, so maybe like 15, 20 of us. But for the whole season, I'm not sure. Um, I would say maybe like 60, 70% of those 480. Yeah. Um, but so, I think this was a pretty deadly year. Deadly year. Seventeen people died this season, due to falls, exposure, the combination of the two. What do you think got it? I think the combination been? of the two. Um, yeah. Actually, I didn't read too much into it because I didn't want to. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, fair. I think uh, there, like everything from, um, I think a doctor had died at Camp Two just from cardiac arrest. Uh, some American physician, um, some woman. I think she was a Chinese woman. Just kind of. That's an, an, another thing, too, is once you're above 8,000 meters, you really start losing your mind, or it's possible to start losing your mind, and she just apparently unclipped and fell down the side of the mountain, just seemed like she was disoriented. Okay. Yeah, slid down from, yeah, basically right over Camp 4, right above Camp 4 to Camp 2. Nice couple thousand feet of... Tobogganing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure she had fun in her final moments. Ah, oh, fuck, man. I hope she was knocked out unconscious very early in that. Oh, yeah. That would have been... A lot. Um, yeah, it seems to be a lot of, con well, not a lot. I mean, to be honest, the number of people on earth who probably care about climbing at Everest is small. But for the people who pay attention to it, it does seem to be that there is some controversy about the number of people, the the impact when it comes from a waste perspective. It really, it really irks people that climbers will pass other climbers that are in duress and not actually help them. Yeah, but I understand it. I mean, um, there are people like NIMS who can... Uh, he can function. He can function. It's actually scary. I've uh, he, he's he's you know not human. It's it's pretty uh, un unreal. But he um, there was a Nepali army captain who went up with a group of guys a few days before us, or I think just the day before us. Um, the conditions were so bad, worse than the day we went up, much worse to the point where the rest of his crew said, "Okay, fuck this. We're going back down to Camp Four." This guy said, "I want to summit. I'm going to go up and meet you guys back down." Um, he never came back. And when we started climbing, we saw this, this person in a, uh, yellow North face, um, summit suit sitting up there. And we were like, Oh, that must be one of the bodies. As we get closer, we see it's rocking back and forth. And it was the guy he had summited. Apparently he'd come back down and just collapsed right, uh, right past the Hillary step. And his hands were black, as black as my sweatshirt. Um, he'd taken his gloves off just cause he had kind of lost his yeah. mind. Um, sleeves were full of ice and, um, he had no oxygen and... But was still alive. Still alive somehow, Fuck. barely. 
barely. My buddy Aldo passed him and said, how long have you been up here? And he's like, uh, five minutes. It had been six plus hours. Totally lost his mind at that point. Nims put a oxygen mask on him. He, you know, had one of his Sherpas leave a spare uh, oxygen canister, put a mask on him. They went and summited because that was his primary mission. And then on his way back down, he's like, we're going to get this guy down. Um, he's probably still going to die because the rest of his crew isn't at Camp 4. We can't get a helicopter up to Camp 4 to, to get him out of there too high up. And somehow, I actually have a video of it, somehow got him down to Camp 4. Um, the guy found the energy to, energy to kind of wobble. Um, Nims' team is amazing. They got him down. And then he somehow got all the way back down to base camp. Not only survived, but kept his hand somehow. What? Yeah. And you're talking black as your sweatshirt. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were they were frozen. His nose too, his whole face, um, pretty pretty amazing. Fuck. What do you do if you have to pee on the way up? I'm thinking about things freezing. I'm like, it would really suck if your <laughs> cock froze off. So it's apparently a huge problem. People, it's what? very easy. Yeah, very easy to get frostbite in your dick. This is all we're talking about for the rest of this. I don't know how long we're going to talk for, but now we've touched on an issue that we have to get to the root cause of, pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> it's dangerous to- Michael, I see Michael's fingers flying. He's he's Googling <laughs> frostbite dick frostbite. Dick, yeah. What did you find? Uh, find videos, Michael. Well, <laughs> I don't find any videos. Oh, but, we know you did. Uh, yes. Not off your personal browsing, but of, of Everest. <laughs> yes, penis frostbite is possible, and incredibly has a picture of Prince Harry here. Oh, yeah, I think he got his, uh, he got some frostbite in his dick. What? Yeah, I think he wrote about it, actually. Yeah, in, in, his, his, book. in his book. Did he go to yeah. Everest? No, I don't think so. Where did he get frostbite on his dick, then? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. You have to read his book. Yes, penis frostbite is, frostbite is possible. So you're t- you're telling me people are literally freezing their cocks off? Yes, on Everest. you got to be careful. Yeah. So most people will hold it if it's too cold and do it in a bottle in the tent and then empty that bottle. Um, Sometimes that's not possible. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. you got to be careful. God damn it! I know what's going to keep me up today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that would be. I'd rather lose my nose, lose my ears, than lose my dick. Yeah. I mean, if, if those were the only three choices, <laughs> I would ask for a different choice, which would be none of those things happening. Yeah, it's preferable. Fuck. So when you make it back to base camp, do you just collapse and sleep for a few days? I mean, oh, yeah. Yeah, that is just <laughs> best feeling in the world. Get into, your, get into your tent nice and warm. I mean, the sun hits base camp uh, nicely. It gets warm down there. And When you say warm, throw a number out here. Uh, 50, 60 degrees. Fahrenheit. No shit. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So actually, you could be warm in that. Yeah. I mean, it gets much colder, but uh, during the day, if the sun is out, yeah, it gets, gets nice. And you're just face down, just eating pillow. Just. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You get down, <laughs> and you're just kind of like, fuck, just pass pass out. All right. Yeah. How'd you get out of there? Uh, helicopter. Yes. So, yeah. That's faster than walking up the Yeah. Much. <laughs> <laughs> Last thing you want to do is uh, hike back down for a week. Um, so, helicopter oh, brought us. Man. For base camp, picked us up, uh, I think, two days after we got down, or maybe a day, the next day. Brought us to back down to Lukla, transferred helicopters, brought us back down to Kathmandu. Then it's like 80 degrees, um, civilization. It's just the best feeling in the world. How was it when you saw yourself in the mirror the first time? Uh, pretty pretty tough, because <laughs> I don't know if you saw that picture, but uh, my face was destroyed. Yeah, it was pretty hammered. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I had some skin ripped off, like I said, from the mask. Um, the, the, just the windburn and the, the frostbite, frost nip really destroyed the top layer of my skin. So my, my face was nice and dark, a lot of sunburn. Um, and it's weird because something about the altitude and just the elements weathers your face to the point where you have wrinkles and um, just discoloration for weeks, lasted for weeks. Um, but yeah, then, you know, you heal over time and What'd you do afterwards, like in the month after Everest? Just kind of take it easy? <laughs> well, the, Did you the, fucking run the Boston Marathon barefoot or something? It sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> the, the night after we got back to Kathmandu, Nims goes, we're going out to the club. So oh, we're... fuck. <laughs> um, he, he used to be a big drinker. When I met Nims, it was during the World Cup in Qatar, and we went out to a club, and I saw Nims for who he used to be. This He, he can drink more than I think most people I've met. Um but he doesn't drink anymore, but he still brought us out to, it's called Lord of Drinks Kathmandu, and that was our celebration. Um, so did that, that was too much. Um, and then after after I left Kathmandu, I came back to New Jersey, where my parents are, where I'm from. Just kind of took it easy for a couple of weeks with them, laid low, did did some other podcasts in New York with some buddies. Um, but yeah, just relaxed, didn't want to do anything. Just wanted to, yeah, just not exert myself in any way. 
Mr. Musk seems to have a very liberal time off policy. No. <laughs> no, no. Because you were dedicating a lot of time to apparently not working at SpaceX. <laughs> <laughs> well. <do> we... <laughs> I'm thinking I had him six to eight weeks in Kathmandu. You were down in Antarctica. I'm like, God damn you. <laughs> this remote work policy for SpaceX is fantastic. It's non-existent, actually. I, I got very, very, very lucky. It's like the, the antithesis of a liberal, uh, um, you know, time off policy. Um, Was he aware of what you were up to? Yeah. Yeah. Be, uh, in Antarctica, I, th I think I... Emailed. Well, that directly benefited him showing the Starlink in Antarctica live streaming. Like, that's awesome. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people came up to me and were like, this is amazing. I never even heard of Starlink. The fact that it could work down there, I'm going to go get it at my lake house, et cetera. Yep. Um, I'd emailed him before I went down. And I, I you know, emailed him a few times in the past. I know he always looks through his inbox and sees, sees these emails. And I was like, hey, do you want to, um, you know, turn this into something um, official with, with Starlink? No response. So I was like, fuck it. Um, <laughs> Still happy to do it for him. Um, but yeah, I just got lucky. I mean, two weeks of vacation for Antarctica. Um, I think I worked for a week remote down there because our flight was uh, was delayed due to weather. And then with Starlink um, from a shipping container. And then Everest, I had to get special permission to take six weeks unpaid time. Um, yeah. But my, my boss at the time, Jonathan Hoffeller, that guy I mentioned, he... I can't remember if he proposed to his wife or went on his honeymoon uh, at base camp, but he had a special connection with that place, so he was more than happy to to support that and, and give me the time off. Plus, I feel like you probably brought some SpaceX dishes. I did. Yeah, that's yeah. what I'm saying. It's a benefit for everybody. <laughs> yeah. Brought uh, brought six Starlink units up to base camp. and oh, uh, bastard. Yeah. Those fuckers are hard to get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it was uh, pretty amazing having having that up at base camp. God, that is wild. Although somehow um, the local press caught word of of that, and they wrote this whole fabricated story about me bringing Starlink up to the peak of Everest to bring Elon on a virtual climb, and I was like, "Fuck!" I saw that day before the summit push, and like, I'm, I'm going to get fired, and uh, had to reach out and be like, "Look, I, I didn't talk to anybody about this," and they're like, "It's fine. It's a PR team." Wow, I feel like that would be a lot of batteries to carry yeah yeah that would <laughs> and i mean negative 60 i don't even think they're gonna work no i, so. I don't think it's, imagine trying to hold it i mean obviously it was rectangle but holding that appropriately at 70 <laughs> mile an hour winds no no that's not absolutely happening. not I, You're like well there it went i guess somebody <laughs> will find that in 2500 i tried to put, put a uh hold a flag up and that was tough i can barely keep it up so that's crazy how'd you come to work for starlink or spacex i should say yeah, that's a good question. I was at uh, I was in New York because I'm I'm from uh, East Coast originally. Went to school down by DC University of Maryland. Uh, go Terps. What'd you get um, your degree in? Uh, environmental engineering. So really, yeah, hopped around a few times. I think I started in biology. Was thinking about medical school, but huh. then realized what what that encompassed and was like, fuck, fuck that. Um, yeah, ended up in environmental engineering that that realm, and then. Went to go work for a startup, totally unrelated in New York, and then got out of a seven-year relationship, realized I had all this freedom, and moved out to, to Utah, to Salt Lake for a couple of years, just to experience something new. Big skier, big hiker, so it was great for that. Um, and then got bored of my job there, and had always loved SpaceX, had always loved the, their mission, and just kept looking at what jobs were available, and had to interview for three different positions, and finally landed um, within this product product management team, although Elon hates that term, so we went by product engineering, um, for Starlink, and yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. That's not the degree and path that I would have thought would have landed you at that company. No. But no. I have heard that he hires based more for the person than necessarily the educational background. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, the interviews are more about sussing out the type of person you are, how yeah. versatile you are. Um, and like I said, the, the interview process was uh, pretty difficult. I interviewed for a position... Um, did not get it. Interviewed uh, for a different position. Did not get that. And for the, for the third uh, interview, third position, I wanted to showcase more my ability to be able to learn. And um, I forget what I did, but uh, yeah, I think I, I was able to showcase that. And they were like, okay, yeah. Come. What kind of questions do they ask you in these interviews? Hmm, a lot of almost kind of case study questions around stuff related to uh, the projects you'd be working on. So 
I think in across all three of those interviews, it was like theoretical situations with uh, everything from like Starlink fiber infrastructure to, um, you know, for my, my final position, how you would uh, design or build products based on, you know, different criteria. Um, and it's more so about hearing your thought process through uh, yeah. that, that than um, kind of the end result. But yeah, just things like that. And I deeply appreciate people interviewing, trying to find more out about the person than yep. just, so what cool did you go to? All right, cool. What was your GPA? <laughs> what did you get your degree in? Yeah. And I say that, I'm, I barely graduated high school. I have zero seconds of college. And some of the dumbest motherfuckers I've ever met have a lot of degrees. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I, <laughs> I know. I'm like, wow, you do <laughs> what? Maybe I should have gone to college. However, I would have completely failed out because I was not ready for it. Yeah, I don't 18. think college is for everybody. Um, I wasn't ready for it at that age. I needed more time. I think yeah. now I have my GI Bill. I don't know what the hell I would do with it, honestly. You know, people say, go, go learn how to be a pilot. I already did that. So <laughs> can't really use it for that. I don't know what I would study. I've enjoyed more navigating myself around the globe and learning that way. And yeah. I know I understand that there is a, a gap of knowledge that's not filled in doing that. But goddamn, there's some powerful lessons out there just by oh, yeah. experiencing it yourself. I think that is infinitely more valuable than a college degree. Yeah. So how long did you work for SpaceX? Just over two years. Left, and what uh, exactly did you do? So our, our team, like the actual responsibilities shifted around a, a, a little bit uh, during my, my uh, two, two years and, and change there. But uh, we we're essentially like the product development, product management team. So we were taking this, uh, everything we had available with the Starlink technology and infrastructure and trying to find different applications for it, uh, specifically within the government and enterprise space. So how do we get Starlink onto commercial uh, aircraft? How do we get it onto merchant vessels, cruise ships, things like that? Um, so the Starlink business product, which was our first non-consumer uh, product launch, was actually mine. So um, I was tasked with figuring out what... Um, what features and, and things to incorporate into that product and then launching it. Um, now we have aviation, now we have maritime, um, and that, that was all our team. And we were working with the government trying to, to help them integrate Starlink into their programs. And It's pretty wild. The it thought is. that soon enough, sooner, well, actually, I don't know, you could answer that, sooner rather than later. I don't know how many of those damn satellites are up there. I feel like there's several. Probably <laughs> <laughs> probably at this point, maybe 6,000 or so. But what's wasn't it in the 20,000s for the total coverage? We want to get to, I think we have um, approval for 12,000 right now, and then we ultimately want to get up to 42,000. Fuck, that is insane. Oh, oh yeah. my nice. God. There we go. Is this live, Michael? Like, uh, That's what it says. It, this site oh, isn't affiliated shit. with them at all. But, I mean, I think, if you zoom in, it sh says which one is our yeah, which. I think that's probably live. Dude, those are moving. Yeah. How come some of them are in a line like that? That is what they look like right after they are brought up on a rocket and ejected uh, oh. from the fairing. So they have to find their way to their position, if you will. Yes. Yeah, yeah. They're kind of put into this uh, temporary um, orbit, and then they will use their little um, thrusters to bring themselves to their final Final orbital plane. I guess you get some dope download speeds though when they're like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but Holy but you can. I don't know if you've ever seen them though. Like you can see. I have those. seen those. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yep. You can see those from like the aliens. Like, uh, <laughs> or it's Starlink. Yeah, but it does look pretty wild. <laughs> Holy shit, Michael! Can you zoom that back out? Yeah. Yeah, we have quite a few up there. Can you imagine? I was going to say a hundred years ago, but I'll be honest with you. I think even 20 years ago, saying to somebody, okay, here's the plan. Mm. We're going to launch so many satellites that you can have basically broadband internet anywhere on the fucking face of the planet. It's pretty well. tells you they're crazy. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so many, I mean, not so many, but a few companies have tried to do this over the past five or 10 years and have failed miserably. Um, so think, what do you think the difference is with SpaceX? That's a good question. I think... Um, we just have a very unique approach um, towards, you know, getting things done where you want to move fast, you want to break a lot of things, make mistakes, but learn as quickly and iterate as quickly as possible. Um, what are those red dots? Probably. I think they're stations, ground stations. Oh, yeah. Gateway sites. What does that mean? So that is where. Is that where the NSA taps in? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, so the. 
the internet up until Starlink was just uh, a system of fiber, fiber optic yeah. cable. And to get the internet to those satellites, you obviously have to, to beam that signal up. So these gateway sites are connected to that fiber infrastructure. Gotcha, yeah. They beam the internet up to the satellites, and then satellites beam that back down to the end user terminals. Holy shit, there's another one of those lines. Yep. Yeah, Holy been, I think shit, we've been launching quite a, a few recently. It actually, you look at these maps and you wonder how the hell we can actually successfully launch anything off Earth's orbit without yeah. running into one of those. Yeah, but you'd be, you'd be surprised. There's a it's lot va- of, yeah. It's vast. Yeah. I'm saying, well, this, I mean, we're looking at an image that's like six inches. Like, oh my God, <laughs> you can't do it. <laughs> it's, it's pretty vast. Yeah. And I think we're pretty good with tracking everything oh, within orbit. Shit. I think, uh, I think the U.S. government is able to track every single piece of matter more than like two millimeters in orbit. You know, it looks like that line's going over Canada, and I'll be honest, we could just skip that part. Let's get a few more of those <laughs> over Montana. The top hat of America can wait a little bit longer, okay? Look at that. They're all going to goddamn deploy over Canada. Son of a bitch. How have the speeds been in Montana? Uh, because everything comes down to congestion um, in a lot of cases. There's just over a million people in Montana. Yeah. So, so it must be good. It's pretty good. Cool. I know people who use it for their business internet. It's yeah. that good still okay. to this point. Good. I, I don't know if it'll ever... It would even be possible to hit the congestion of like an L.A. or San Francisco type area. But also, I don't know why you would need it there because you probably have access to fiber. Yeah. Yeah. In the more uh, urban areas, you'll never, never need it. But God, that is I just the idea, the concept of do you think it'll ever be where you could don't even need a dish? It just comes to something like this. Yeah. Yeah. We actually have a direct to sell program, which is doing exactly what we do with the dishes, but with your cell phone. So I would say next five or so years, it'll be... Just unfettered communication yes. anywhere on the globe. Yep. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty pretty wild. When was electricity harnessed and invented, Michael? <laughs> <laughs> Not that long ago. I was going to say, are we under 200 years? I mean, I know my dad was alive, but... <laughs> Man... I think my, my great grandma um, didn't have electricity in her home when she was younger, and that was. And now we're talking about direct to your cell phone, yeah. Satellite it's communication, pretty, pretty wild. Fuck. It was like nineteen fifteen, nineteen twenty. Seven. The downside of that is, you will have to have the willpower to turn it off. Yes. To escape the bombardment. Yep. <laughs> Seventeen fifty two. Run the math on that. Yeah, it's about two hundred fifty years. Two hundred seventy years, actually. Yeah, carry the one. We've gone from that to uh... we've gone from that to uh, yeah, <laughs> one dude saying "fuck this," we're putting satellites in orbit. Yep, man. So how'd you come to the conclusion you, you needed to leave? Um, that's a good question. I, I think I, I'm, I'm sure any current employees will not like me saying this, but I think if you spend more than a few years at SpaceX, you lose your mind. It's very just fast paced, very stressful, very chaotic, and. Um, a lot, and I, I feel like I had learned everything I wanted to, and I learned learned a shit ton. Not only about uh, our technology, obviously, but just how to operate, how to uh, solve problems. Really opened my mind to new ways of approaching problems, problem solving. Um, and I was ready for something new. Um, I want to ultimately do my own thing, maybe work on some of my own projects, start my own company. So, uh, and hadn't really had any time, some downtime to really relax. And that's what I'm doing now. Just taking a few months, nothing on the horizon, and yeah. Um, yeah, we'll see where it goes. How old are you? 29. Just turned 29 this summer. God damn you. <laughs> 45. I've done like half the shit you've done. Still young. Still young. Not really. Yeah, 45's young. I'll check back with you when you're 45. <laughs> I'm going to ask you. Like, okay. Do you remember when you said 45 is young? How does it feel? You got some miles on your body, too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Where'd the uh, spirit of adventure come from? What was your What was your upbringing life? Was it... You always felt that way, because some people look at mountains and go, "I want to, I want to see what's on top of that." Yeah, I and think others go, "I need to go around that." <laughs> <laughs> I think there is a. It was a lot of my grandfather, my my mother's father, his his influence. Um, he was. He always talks about this this gene, this this adventure gene, um, which is a real thing. It, it's it. Uh, determines if you are that person who wants to go see what's on the other side of the mountain or at the top of the mountain versus not. In the human genome? Yeah. It's actually, yes, okay. in the human genome. Um, he definitely has that. That's why he always talks about it. And I think I got that. And then growing up, he had taken me, um, we were in rural New Jersey. So you think of New Jersey, think of Jersey City, um, urban, but we were in farm country right on the border of Pennsylvania. Growing up, he would take me hiking, um, uh, bring me to, um, you know, 
I think there was a, a wolf or coyote rehabilitation center nearby. She hmm. brought me to that at a young age. And uh, he had a bunch of crazy exotic birds, like golden pheasants and everything, he, a bunch of birds in his backyard. So got uh, fascinated with wildlife and, and nature from that. And then he was a big adventurer in a way. I think he's probably been to at least a third of the countries on earth at this point. Um, really interesting guy and always like always told me to keep an open mind. Um, and I think he instilled that spirit of adventure in me from a, an early age. And yeah, the rest is history. And then assuming I have that gene, maybe, yeah, just wanted to. What was your first big adventure? First big adventure? Um, when I was 14, my grandparents, him and his wife, my, my grandmother, they brought me to Spain, Andorra, and France for like a month-long road trip. And I think that was my, my first true adventure. Um, and then my first like risky big adventure was when I was 23, that row I was telling you about. So that was right after I graduated college, I was ha- kind of having this existential crisis, <laughs> as many of us do. I was going to say. I mean, college wasn't for me either, but uh, I felt bad. I was like, ah, I got to do it. I want to make my parents happy. Um, but I was like, I'm not going to get right into a corporate job, lose my life, as I as I saw so many friends um, doing. And I was on this website called Explorers Connect. I forget how we found it, but people will look for additional members for an expedition or event that way. It's kind of these classified type posting postings. Um, and there was this one that was uh, framed as an ultra endurance event. They were looking for a sixth team member. And I was big into distance running at the time. I was like, oh, fuck it. I'll check it out. And this Icelandic dude uh, wound up reaching out. And he's like, hey, I saw you uh, express some interest in joining. Just so you know, it's a row. We'll be on the water for three weeks. You'll be rowing uh, for 90 minutes, every 90 minutes for three weeks straight. And uh, he's like, just pass these physical requirements on the erg machine. And um, just know that it's mostly mental. And yeah, next thing you know, I was up in Svalbard getting on this 28, 28 and a half foot fiberglass rowboat with five other guys. And that was my first big adventure. It's real sausage fest. Yeah. <laughs> How was that? That was pretty crazy. Um, I was 23 at the time. And like, and the ocean is unforgiving, man. Oh, it is. You want to talk about, like, don't get me wrong. Antarctica, Everest, you can kill yourself right quick. Yeah. But goddamn. But you're on land. That's like where. Yeah. <laughs> the ocean you, is unforgivable. It is. It really is. It's. Um, yeah, I, I think the closest I ever came to death so far was on that row. Uh, the first three days after we left um, Svalbard, where the, the water was glass, it was pristine conditions. I like the shit's easy. <laughs> <laughs> but then, then we we hit the edge of the polar ice cap, so like actually right up, um, kind of see it. Zoom in and go to the right, Michael. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, right around there where the mouse is a little more. A little bit more to the right. Yeah, a little bit little more bit to more. the right. There you go. That's good. A little higher. That Actually, that, that archipelago right to le- yeah, right there is where we started from. Went up to the edge of the polar ice cap, which was a little bit north of that, and then back down um, to an island that I'm not even sure if you could see on this map, uh, north of Iceland. First three days were fine, and then um, the eight days after that were just relentless storms. Um, maybe like 10 to 20 foot swells. Uh, crazy. And you were in, what did you say, a 28-foot watercraft? 28 and a half foot fiberglass boat. In 20-foot yeah. swells? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> daddy. Yeah. The, the Captain Fion, uh, I think he's like the best um, or most experienced ocean rower in the, in, in the world. He had rowed the Indian Ocean, Pacific, and Atlantic uh, many times over. And there's this thing called a, a um, what is it called? A sea anchor. It's like this giant parachute that opens up like 10 meters under the water that keeps you in a relatively relatively stable position because uh, the currents aren't as strong yeah. that, at that depth. He uh, had never had to use it once in his career, and we opened it three times on that row. Did it make a difference for stability-wise? It did, but uh, the boat was still doing this. Uh, all six of us had to cram into the, the two cabins on either end of the boat, stay there for eight hours in some instances. I'm, I'm under three guys that are old, like 200 pounds plus, just head, Mike, head in the cone. Michael's spinning. wet dream, <laughs> what you just described right there. I'm hard right now. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Michael, keep it serious. <laughs> that was gnarly. Um, at what point did people start throwing up on each other? <laughs> uh, first storm, and oh, it was God. mostly me. Someone opened a... Uh, I don't think someone, it exploded this thing of almond butter all over me. And just the smell of that with the, the roaring waters, I started vomiting all over. And uh, yeah, 
How much rest can you even really get 90 on, 90 off? I mean, it's going to take you a little bit to get, like, calm down. Yep. Physical exertion's coming to an end. Gotta, You're probably getting change. A, yeah. Eat. What are you getting? 60 minutes of sleep? Maybe. Maybe. I would say 45 at best. <sighs> Shit. So you're like lobotomized towards the end of this, just rowing with one eye opened. Yeah. It was a lot. It was supposed to be three weeks, but uh, our electrical system short-circuited. So we had to call, call it off uh, early, and that's why we stopped at Jan Mayen, this little military base island north of Iceland. Um, so we were on the water for two weeks. Good God. Yeah. What was your next adventure after that? Next adventure after that was two years later, I did the Marathon de Sable. It was a 150-mile race in the Sahara Desert in Morocco. It was fun. Um, it was the opposite. It was I don't on, think it was online. fun. I think you chose a poor word. I think <laughs> T- you mean type it two fun. Type yeah, two fun. Type two fun. <laughs> <laughs> sucked in the moment. Fun yeah. in retrospect. Yeah. Um, that was yeah. It was it was the opposite. You're on land, sweltering heat. Um, that was that was a good time. I think I'm doing it again this April actually. So I have some Why? friends that want to do it, and I, I like doing these things with Get friends. On a motorcycle so. <laughs> or a freaking quad or a razor or something. Motorcycles are fun. Yeah. Fuck. I did a, an 1,100-mile uh, motorcycle um, trip around the Balkans a couple of years ago. We're going to do my business part in the coffee shop. We're going to go Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, to the tip of Florida next June. No way. Yeah. That'll be... Tip to tip. It's not a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Uh, well, Fieldcraft Survival, my buddy uh, Mike Glover is going to bring a vehicle with Starlink mm-hmm. on it. Shocker, because he nice. wants to do content the whole way. Yep. We were looking at the most direct route, but I actually, we're going to probably just follow the Rockies as far south as we can. Yeah, keep it beautiful. Well, because as soon as you turn east, it's flat as shit. Yeah. And it's just puts Real some slicks. Real boring. Yeah, turn some slicks on that thing and just haul ass. Uh, what else? So you did the marathon. Which, what's, I'm not going to call 150 miles a marathon. I'm going to call that psychotic, but <laughs> what else? Did that. Um, Everest, I did, uh, when, when COVID was at its peak, and remote work started to to take hold. I was like, well, I got to take advantage of this somehow. And it was January of 2021. I realized that Ecuador was one of the only countries on earth that was allowing Americans to come in at the time. So I said to my girlfriend at the time, let's just go down there for a month or so and do some stuff. So flew down there, did my first real mountaineering, which was Chimborazo and Cotopaxi, both around 20,000 feet. Um, it was an adventure, Antarctica, uh, Everest, and a bunch of little ones in between. So, yeah. What do you get out of the adventures? What does it provide for you? That's a good question. Um, I have I have this philosophy that the more you can pull into your comfort zone that was previously outside of your comfort zone, the more you could just, you know, walk through life um, more easily. Uh, you know, I, w- I remember when I was in college, I did a semester in uh, in Europe and. I was in Copenhagen, and you're still around students, all studying abroad, and it's not it's not that big of a culture shock. But I did this weekend trip to Poland by myself just to see a new country, um, and at the time that was like a pretty big adventure for me. It was you know having to navigate how to find hostels, how to get around, what to see, where to eat, um, and now if I go to a country by myself, it's like easy easy to navigate, and that was because over time I've you know done all these trips and. You know, when you go out and do Everest or, you know, spend a week in the Sahara, it's not fun. Like you like you said, it's definitely not fun. Depends on what you're doing. That's true. That but is true. There's some five-star resorts in the Sahara. We just don't know of them. <laughs> that is true. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you you find the mental fortitude to get through that, uh, have a lot of conversations with yourself. Um, and then when you come back to normal life, I remember coming back to my, my uh, desk in the office in my nice cozy uh, office in New York City after that ultra marathon. It's like, this is easy. Like, how could I complain? And um, just teaches you a lot about yourself, teaches you a lot about how to navigate difficult situations. And um, yeah. Out of all the adventures you've done, which one do you think has impacted you or changed you the most? Ooh. Um, uh, probably. Probably that row, honestly, because that was kind of what set into motion all of these subsequent adventures. And I was this naive little 23-year-old boy. And it's it's so funny because when you look back at the time and in, in, in the moment, you think you are uh, so adept um, and ready for adventure and, and life experiences. But looking back, it's crazy how far I've come since then mentally and um, with these experiences and being close to death um, in that regard, like being almost thrown off the boat and having to face that for the first time. 
um, having to find the mental fortitude to pull yourself together um, and keep calm and row in those conditions, which were um, just unreal scary. That kind of, there was almost a um, moment where I was like, this is amazing. Uh, After the fact, uh, I want more of this. I want to continue to push myself, uh, push these boundaries. And I think that was the most formative, that, that row. Your generation gets a lot of shit talked about them. Yeah. I'm being honest. <laughs> Fair How, enough. Fair enough. Well, you're the your your work ethic, desire to go headlong after things that are difficult is not what people are talking shit about. Mm. It's the other end of the spectrum. The sense of enti- and I'm using other people's words here, but largely grouping them in. You know, the sense of entitlement. Yes. They don't want to work hard. Um, an app, you know, they they were raised on apps and it's like instant gratification versus going into the type two fun, realizing yes. that on the far end of the type two fun is type one fun and mm-hmm. you can actually grow from it. How well do you get along with the uh, people your age? Do you find sometimes that you are cut from a different cloth perhaps? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. All the time. Um, yeah, I do, I do think my generation, and I, I think it's largely due to social media. Um, I, I think there's a lot of what you just mentioned. Because people, I think the vocal minority has a lot more of an ability to spread these ideas, which are seemingly like, um, you know, exciting things because they give people excuses that maybe they didn't think about prior and there's more of a community for them to Well, they can, they can trick people into thinking it's the majority too. Exactly. Yeah. Because, I mean, with, with everything you look at nowadays, it's really just a vocal minority. A um, very small vocal yeah. minority that is largely occupying the great bandwidth that Starlink is providing for us. <laughs> <laughs> that is true, yeah. We need to throttle some of that. Yes. Actually, fuck, we can't because then that censorship. God damn, we're fucked. We're fucked. We're fucked. <laughs> yeah, I, I do uh, I do think that I get along um, a lot better with people who are not only older than me in the U.S., but also people from other countries, I think, who have... Uh, I think that's more of a problem in the U.S. and a lot of the Western world. But, like, you go to some of these countries, like... Nepal, for example, where there's still this very um, strong sense of, you know, having to work hard for a good life and, um, you know, not complaining, not having this, this sense of entitlement and, you know, finding friends there. So, Do you ever try to convince other people of your age to perhaps just pull their head out of their ass and work harder? <laughs> yeah, it, I do. All how's the that time. go for you? All the time. Uh, <laughs> pe- people, generally, <laughs> people generally don't like to hear that. Um, people Shocker. <laughs> People have a lot of their identity wrapped up in in those beliefs, and when you challenge it in any way, shape, or form, you're going to get you know them being defensive and uh, a lot of yelling. So, is it even worth it? I try. I try. Trust me. I try. Also, and I have that same conversation with myself. Is it even worth it? I tell myself that if we could move the needle a little bit, that yes, it would be worth it. But I oftentimes worry about whether or not it actually will move the needle. Yeah. I think you have to keep trying. Yeah. I think as long as you're willing to keep trying, then we're going to be okay. It's when people just surrender to the status quo and or just give up yeah. in general, then then I think we have a problem on our hands. But you've certainly you have certainly accomplished and done a lot more. Like nobody's going to be talking shit about you in the <laughs> well, millennial sure cohort. Well. Trust me, people are going to talk shit about everybody, but they're not going to talk about it from the perspective that most millennials are discussed from. And I, having said that, I've had great experiences with millennials and also the very stereotypical experiences with them as well. But <laughs> also sorry. in my age group, too. <laughs> really? Oh, see, there's fuckboys everywhere. Wow. Huh. Yeah. Just, you think it's great for somebody who's, uh, you know, a decade and a half farther down the road, be like, uh, fucking younger generation it's like shut up dude you still live at your mom's house <laughs> yeah. fuck Dorito staining fingers shut the <laughs> fuck up <laughs> yeah I know yeah. I know how you feel yeah for but, sure what uh you got any countries left on your bucket list I feel like you're kind of the type of guy who's like yeah it's what is today Tuesday you're like yeah Thursday it's uh we're going to uh, <laughs> Pakistan because fuck it yeah, I almost I almost went to Pakistan this summer to do uh, K two and that the, was just an example. I wasn't being serious. I'm asking <laughs> if you have any places on your bucket list. Um, yeah, plenty. I mean, I want to see it all, but uh, nothing comes to mind. Like I feel like I'm in a stage now. I mean, I just left SpaceX. I just got done with Everest, and I just kind of want to relax and have fun. I mean, I'm up here in uh, Montana for my buddy's wedding, but just taking a week on the lake just to relax. 
And there's worse ways to spend time. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But like <laughs> finding enjoyment in just sitting on the edge of a lake, um, the same way I do, you know, doing these crazy things is is nice. Um, You're an old soul. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. yeah. Finding enjoyment while sitting on the side of a lake, reading a Steinbeck novel, smoking your <laughs> ivory handled pipe. Yep. Exactly. Figuring out your next business plan. Yeah. What's your favorite country you've been to so far? Mongolia. Really? Easy answer. Yeah. And actually, that's actually another adventure I didn't mention. Um, I, I was dating girl for seven years, and after that uh, relationship, that's when I left New York. And before I went to um, Utah, I, my sister was in uh, Bali surfing, and I was like, well, fuck it, I'll just go visit her and get my mind off of things. And my grandpa, uh, going back to him, he had always mentioned Mongolia being on his bucket list. He's like, it's just this place that, that calls to me. It looks absolutely beautiful, untouched by tourism. You have the step to just rolling out into infinity. And when I was in Bali, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. I'll go. Uh, I want to go see Mongolia. So uh, that's the last time I didn't have a job. Um, I was like, well, maybe I'll you know buy a one-way ticket and see how much time I want to spend up there. I wound up renting a car and spending a month just driving around the step uh, in the Gobi Desert and uh, didn't have service. I think I had three weeks of alone time completely by myself. Just, no shit. Yeah. And it's, uh, federally legal to camp anywhere in the country. Um, so I, I had a tent, I had a, a lawn chair, uh, my, my headphones and a sleeping bag, and then would just pick up supplies in these little teeny towns out in the steppe, just ventured out and it was unbelievable. Do you find not a lot of, of people that I've encountered in my life actually have a deep level of comfort being alone? Like oftentimes alone time for them is actually, it, it, it kind of sucks energy out of them. It sounds to me like you actually get recharged by it. I do. Yeah. But I, I understand too why people don't like it because you have to, I have this theory that well, the majority, if not all of anxiety and depression stems from, um, you know, a lack of communication with oneself. Um, you know, if there are things in one's life that are not confronted, your body's going to send you signals that, you know confront these. And that is what anxiety really means to me. Cause I, I felt anxiety. And then, you know, if I go and do something like that, I did in Mongolia and really confront these things then it seems to dissipate. Um, how do you confront them? Do you talk to yourself? Yeah. Internally. Um, do you ever do it externally? Maybe a few times here and there. I talk to myself all the time. Really? Oh dude. Really? I have like the craziest conversations with myself <laughs> and it's usually, you should try it. Sometimes I'll do it when I have my headphones in and I'll, and I'll realize that my middle son who lives with us is just staring at me like I'm fucking Hannibal Lecter. <laughs> just like, who are you talking to? Me? It's a great conversation. Fuck off, you know? <laughs> it's good. It's good to talk to, uh, talk to yourself. Um, yeah. I think it feels like more of a real conversation if you verbalize both sides. Yeah. Maybe I'll start doing that. You inspired me. I have no idea if it's the right or wrong path to go down. I'm just saying that me personally... I don't know, I'm, it feels I'm, almost embarrassing to admit it, but yeah, I talk to myself all the time. <laughs> Imagining you as uh, Gollum from Lord of the Rings, like looking at me like, <laughs> yeah. Andy, we have to, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's my precious. <laughs> God. It's Three good Three weeks of alone. Yeah, that's a lot. It, there's a, uh, in a world where we're bombarded by being connected with our digital devices for about a week, I think people would struggle and then I think they would bask in the gloriousness of the two weeks of being yes. disconnected. Yeah. I think that that's what it was for me. It was about a week of uh, uncomfortable FOMO. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. What am I missing out on? The yeah. answer, nothing. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> Social media makes it tough. I mean, you see, oh, it sucks. And it's always people showing the best sides of their lives. So everything looks yeah. like more fun um, and, and infinitely better than it is in, in real life. It's, actually, it's an artificial measuring stick that everybody. Yes. Li- it's, why? Like, here's a question that I have. Why are there filters? <laughs> That's I true. Mean, think about it. Why do we do that? You know damn well that people are going to use it to camouflage who they actually yes. are to a degree. Why are we advocating people do that? How is that healthy in any way, shape, or form that you just have to scroll through to you find what you think looks like your best self, just fucking be yourself. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> it's it's not healthy, but that's like that's exactly what the people who run the show are, you know, doing purposely is giving access to those filters because they know it's going to be uh, make things more addictive you're going to get those little dopamine hits and continue to use the the platform oh i can look better if i use this filter i'll keep using the social media platform to use this filter so and now in five years it's just going to go right to your cell phone yes from space yeah fuck do you think he's going to do mars 
Yeah, I do. I really do. Um, do you think he will go? I think he wants to die there. That's a, that's his plan. Like you look at uh, Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos, and they have already gone into near orbit. But uh, there's a reason Elon hasn't. I don't think he wants to. That's like inner space. Yeah, it's he wants space. to go to outer space. Yeah, these guys are pathetic. <laughs> it's um, like that's trash. He can <laughs> curvature. He's 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 good. He steers a ship, and I don't think he wants to take any risks with his life before he thinks things are in a good place. And then I think he probably. Once we have some type of permanent settlement on Mars, he'll probably spend his last five, ten years up there. I think that's his plan. And I think it'll happen. It's delayed Fuck. from where he thought it would be ten, ten years ago. Things keep getting pushed, but uh, it'll happen in our lifetimes. Really? You think yeah. he can do it? 100%. Uh, Starship is the, the rocket that will take us there. And things have been delayed with uh, the FAA and just the technology. So, Which rocket is that? Is that the one they're already using for satellite in the uh, space station stuff no that is that's all falcon that's our okay. first our first type of uh rockets and then starship is this next generation bigger much bigger it's, it is the biggest uh rocket ever made and uh we just did our first test launch back in april i want to say self-landing also it will be self-landing yeah how fucking ridiculous is that and yeah, mike you should uh pull, yeah there we go oh yeah 120 meters a little under 400 feet high it is fucking huge. If you see, Mike, if you look up, uh, uh, look up a picture of, there's this famous photo of these guys putting the final final touches on um, the uh, heat resistant tiles that they put on one side for reentry. Just it puts puts into perspective the the size of this thing. It's insane. I'm not gonna lie to you. I like it when these things blow up. It's fun. It's definitely. I'm fun. not. I don't want anybody to be up in the nose capsule, <laughs> but I love it when the attempted reentry and landing fails. Yeah, it's fun. <laughs> it is fun. Jet fuel. God damn it goes up high order <laughs> or whatever mixture that they're using. It's probably some ridiculous hydrogen combination, but did, did you I, see the, the video of the test test launch for this? No. Oh, it explodes real beautifully. Yes. Michael, you know what to do. <laughs> Hold on. I'm looking up the, Oh, this is star hopper. No. Star hopper was, I think an early iteration of this. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm trying, trying to get to some of the technology done. One picture you were talking about. This thing is fucking huge, though. It is insane. But that thing would be capable of getting to Mars. Yes. Yeah, yeah. This will do all the Mars missions. It'll be our new... Is it going to come back? It will. Um, That's plan... a lot of gas. It's a lot of gas. The plan is to... Look at that. Yeah, that is the... Holy <laughs> shit. It's no joke. And this is actually the um, mechanism for catching the rocket upon reentry. So those arms will shift and kind of close in on the rocket when it's coming back down, and it'll catch it. So it's not going to land in the same exact way as the the Falcon. The fact that it's reusable is just unbelievable. Oh, yeah. It's cut down on costs. Like, yeah, and this is – you'll actually be able to refuel in orbit. They'll have separate starships, which are purely refueling starships. Michael? That's sick. The future is now. You the need to start putting your application in to ride on the test flights of these. <laughs> I know. I, I really want to. Oh, that shows how big it is right there. Holy yeah. shit. Dang. That's down in Boca Chica. Wow. That looks absolutely nothing like any other spacecraft that I've ever seen used. Oh, yeah. It's totally... It's funny, too, because Elon is uh, Elon. is Elon, And one of my really good friends, uh, Jacob, where he's worked on the, the Starship program for maybe six years now, um, but he said at one point Elon wanted the nose of the rocket to be pointier for no good reason, just to make it look look cooler, and they had to well, do you're it. You're the so. man that signs the checks. You get a, yeah, you oh, get a pointy rocket. Yeah, you get a pointy <laughs> rocket. If I were him, I would have gone a different route, and I would have said, paint a massive cock on the side of that thing <laughs> for no good reason also, but laser etch it in there. I support that. Yeah. I mean, did you see uh, Blue Origin's rocket, Jeff Bezos' rocket? I think it looks like a dick. <laughs> Just, you get I mean, to a degree, they all do a little bit, which I think yeah. has something to do with aerodynamics. But <laughs> <laughs> not exactly an engineer. Michael's an expert in that. He's uh, the phallic symb <laughs> symbolism and symmetry. He can really he can gauge it. Yeah, but if you can get a video of that that first test launch, it's unbelievable. Do you like all explosions? Right. Yeah, let me see. I do. Oh, I think I may have it actually. Right and we here. actually watched that from uh, Lobuche, a town on the way to base camp, which was pretty cool. How does uh, old Mr. Musk respond when things go hydro? Like he's just like, yeah, part of the deal. Yeah, yeah, yeah honestly, uh, I mean, it can't be very cheap though. <laughs> <laughs> very expensive, but yeah. that's part of the reason that SpaceX has been so successful. Is we we want things to break, we want things to explode, and when you look at NASA, it's, oh, well, rockets oh, aren't go. supposed to like fly like that direction. No, 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 no. 
And this test was still successful. The launch pad held up. We yeah. got it to near orbit, but uh, we thought the, the icing on top would be if the uh, second stage could separate and didn't. But I'll be honest, I'm surprised it's still in one piece flying at that at those angles, at that yeah. velocity. There we oh. go. Boom. Daddy. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. Well, better to crack a few eggs on the way to making that perfect omelet as opposed to having somebody up there in the nose cone. Yes, yeah. And that's the, that's the whole philosophy with uh, within SpaceX is move fast, break shit, and you'll learn more from an explosion like that looking at the tel- telemetry than you yep. would trying to make something perfect over four more years. As a SpaceX employee, did you get issued a Tesla? No, there's actually not even a discount. <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. I think they're in such trash. high demand. Yeah, yeah, trash. Uh, they're they're such okay. High de- I'm not a huge fan. Montana's oh, God, not great for him. I hope Elon doesn't see this. I don't, I'm not a huge he fan either. Not. Good. He okay. Yeah, he won't. He, he might. See it. I don't think so. I just think they're not in a place where it's comfortable for me to drive it. I mean, you get 300, 350 miles in a charge, but then you have to go sit 30, 40 minutes somewhere if you're on a long road trip. I just read, a, a, read an article about the Ford CEO mm. who's going to do a coast-to-coast drive in a lightning truck. Okay, yeah, one of those. They're like an F-150, right? Yeah, with a yeah. battery. Yeah, with a battery. He had an eye-open experience. <laughs> They're, the concept is great. Yep. They're a little bit short on technology. Uh, Glover, who lives in Salt Lake City, was going to do a video on it and bring it up here to mm. me and make content along the way. Yep. He brought a gas-powered vehicle. Because when he <laughs> sure. loaded it down with you know a stock truck slick with you know not a lot of weight in there, you're going to get better range. He put all the stuff yep. in there that he would want to bring. Yep. Calculated the number of uh, charging stops he would have to make oh, yeah. and completely scrubbed the idea. <laughs> I'm sure if you tow things or... Um, it really... It cold, reduces it. Yeah. Cold conditions, too. Bad for the battery. That's what I'm saying. I don't yeah. know... I don't In know Montana, if, it would not make sense. No. Elon Musk versus Mark Zuckerberg. MMA fight. Who would win? First I'm, off, how big is Elon? He's pretty... I think he's like 6'2 or 6'3. He's a pretty pretty big he's dude. He's a pretty big guy. Pretty I don't think... Dude. I don't know shit about Zuckerberg. I think he's smaller, though. He's smaller, but but I think Mark Zuckerberg's been uh, doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for a few years now, so I think he might come out yeah. on top. But he's, he's just such a dweeb. Michael's <laughs> Michelle over there has been doing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu for years, and I fuck him up <laughs> all the time. So it's not really helping him. You've got a year on me still. I'm always going to have a year on you, dumbass. <laughs> that's know, how that's time I'm works. Saying. <laughs> I'm saying when you stop, Why would I stop? I'll catch up. That's not how it works. <laughs> when you're 80 <laughs> and I'm... And you're what? 60. <laughs> I'll be dead a long before then. It, well, and the reason I asked about this, size and weight matters for sure. It does. Like, it, like, it gives me a huge advantage over Michael. He's, what are you, like 5'8", 135? <laughs> Actually, I can't tell because he's sitting down. Uh, not... He's like an average height of a woman. He's like a well-muscled female. 5'10", 185. Okay. No. No, you're lying. <laughs> the scale doesn't lie. I will get a fucking scale in here tomorrow and put you on. I believe you on the height. You're not 180. Yeah, I am. I don't believe it. I I don't know. You don't feel like 180. Because I'm not giving you my full force. Yeah, most of the time you're on the bottom. He's at power bottom. So. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, the the size and strength and weight difference. I know that Mark is a blue belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, but it's Mm -hmm. not magic. Mm. That shit's not magic at all. Okay, so maybe Elon. Uh, Elon's a pretty big guy. <sighs> I would like to see it. I don't think it's ever going to happen. Probably. It already seems like it's falling apart. It yeah. got great press. Probably would be. Oh shit! That's August eleventh. <laughs> the world's not even the same anymore, Michael. <laughs> Good old. This was posted ten hours ago, though, so I don't know why it says August eleventh. Yeah, I don't know either. Maybe they edited it or edited it or something. That could be. Well, Mark Cuckerberg on the left there. <laughs> God damn it. What kind of company do you want to start? What do you want what do you want to do? Who knows? The world's in front of you as your oyster. That's true. Um what sector I should say. Not specifically what kind of business, but what I've, I've thought about everything. Like everything from like I I, <laughs> I love coconut water and I I've I've been thinking about like This took a weird turn, but tell me more. <laughs> <laughs> no, but just just as as an example, I, I, everything from like coconut water to something in technology. Like my, my friend and I had been talking about the HVAC space, uh, maybe trying to innovate there because it's like one of the few spaces that there's been very little innovation in over yeah. the past like 90 so or so years. Um, but I have no idea. I think that's why I want to take the next few months and just really reflect, think. Um, 
I just talked to one of my buddies who he's he himself has started a really really successful company, and he his advice uh, was to do what you have genuine interest in and, and passion for, um, and you could do a much better job uh, following that path than if you just try to to pick a space that seems lucrative or. Um, Money's a trap, man. Yeah, that's what I've come to find. I have made some galactically stupid decisions about money. Oh, so have I. And uh, no happiness was on the other end of that pot of gold. I'm sure. There was no pot of gold. It was just a hole that I poured money into and then lit it on fire. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Essentially. And there's the hedonic treadmill, too, where like people... like I, I have friends who have been super successful over the years, and then it doesn't seem like their level of happiness, relative level of happiness, has really changed much once they've come into more wealth or more yeah. success on that front. Um, I think that comes from... Like even just being up here with my one of my good buddies after his wedding, like it's that stuff. Not to not to sound too corny, but um, I feel the same way. To me, wealth is the ability to do what you want to with your time. Yes, freedom on that front. And don't get me wrong; I, I don't want people to, to hear that and say, "Oh, well, I don't like nice things." I like nice <laughs> things. I'm not saying I don't waste fucking money on stupid things. I'm like, yes. and I have this <laughs> fear of not getting it, and then I get it, and I just think to myself, "You're a fucking idiot! Why did you get this?" And it sits on a shelf forever. <laughs> Trust me, I'm totally capable of doing that. But at this phase of my life, I just want to do shit. Like, I'm going to yeah. go to Ireland to do jiu-jitsu in a castle with my wife. Sounds fucking amazing. It's fucking amazing. Is that, what, is getting... that what they're calling nowadays, jiu-jitsu? Yeah, Brazilian jiu Well... No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Yeah. I know what that means. We're doing a ju fucking... Jiu-jitsu in a castle. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to do romantic that, week. too. That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> Michael, you can't come. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's a uh, Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. She's actually going... Is she really? Yeah. She's a oh, world shit. champion black belt. No way. Yeah, she's going down to compete... No uh, way. Shit, she leaves tomorrow morning, actually, for Vegas for Masters wow. Worlds. She would demand that I say a Masters World Champion. Okay. Because there's the adults and then there's the old people. Yeah. <laughs> so, And in jiu-jitsu, I believe Masters starts at the age of 30. Okay. That is <laughs> no way. I had no yeah. idea. No, she's wow. a savage. So she's teaching in a company hit us up. Uh, I think it was Pilgrim Jiu-Jitsu, I think, is their website. They do a bunch of camps all over the world. And so mm. she's going to go teach in a castle in Northern Ireland. We're wow. going to go there a little bit early, fly into Dublin, go out to Ballina, and then just kind of travel around. Like, Nice. I don't like. I don't care if I had five more zeros on my bank account. Mm. That's what I would want to do. Yeah, 100%. I might get there a different way. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I might fly in private, but shit, other than that, I would still spend my time doing the exact same way. I've watched yeah. so many people, this circular rat race of just more money, more money, more money. Yep. And they, everything they buy, it doesn't provide happiness because they're still the same person mm -hmm. at the end. And I tell my kids, I'm like, you better get a job because I'm dying with absolutely nothing. <laughs> and if I have any extra, they're going to put it in the coffin and then burn me in it too. <laughs> I support that. Yep. And one of you fuckers has to light it just so it hurts even mu that much more. <laughs> <laughs> they need, they got to get it on their own, man. Well, they have a good father because uh, what you were saying before about this generation, uh, you know, all the, all the things wrong with it, I feel like you will, will be a good good figure in their life. To, they don't uh, listen to me. That's what I've determined. For now. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> at the age where I remember not listening to my parents at that age, but... Uh, yeah. It'll be good. It's been cool. Uh, and growing up here, too, in Montana, by the way, will make all the difference. I mean, I look at people who I've met who've grown up in Los Angeles, and it's like, whew, different world. Yeah. One of the things I, I wanted to do early with my kids and I've been able to is travel. Mm. So even at a super young age, I mean, we were in uh, – where did we fly into? We flew into Italy. I took him with me to Switzerland when I was over there wingsuit base jumping, like literally flying over the top of them and landing in a wingsuit next to them. That, they probably don't even remember it, mm -hmm. but they were there. They'd been to Scotland. Uh, I want to get them over to Ireland. That's one of my – God, that place is amazing. Yeah. I've been once, but – Yeah. I've only beautiful. been once as well, and uh, we actually ended up doing the entire ring road. Oh, wow. Oh, it was wow. fucking awesome. What I want to do now, though, is navigate the interior on a motorcycle. That'll be amazing. It'll be amazing. You can come if you want to. Okay. Yeah, I'm in. You run it, though, because you're <laughs> crazy, and I'll be on a motorcycle hundreds of miles ahead of you checking okay. in on my Starlink over my phone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you think you'll ever have kids? Yeah, I want to. I want to. I see a lot of uh, a lot of beauty in that. I was just. I actually we just had a really possibly too deep conversation on the dock over over uh, on Flathead Lake the other night after plenty of glasses of whiskey and talking about. Because obviously my buddy, we're getting to that age where all my friends are getting married and starting to have kids and um, the beauty of having kids and like being able to have an impact on the future that way. Like, you yeah. know, um, I want my kids to grow up with uh, all the lessons that I learned the hard way taught to them very early on so that they could be better people. And Don't rob them of their chance to make their mistakes, though. 
Yeah, that's a good point. You can teach them the lessons. I look back at my younger self. I'm defined by the number of things that I've catastrophically fucked up. Oh, me too. I and I was warned. They're like, don't do this. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> don't worry. I won't. And, and I go and do it. There are lessons that you can teach them. And, and again, this is a data point of one, what I've determined with parenting. Even if you – like if it's, a, if it's a catastrophic issue you foresee coming up, like stop it. Yep. I will let my kids fuck up knowing what they are trying to hide from me yeah. so that they learn that lesson. Because That's a good point. I can either let them learn it now mm-hmm. or when they're 40. Yep. I'll take it now. Yeah. And I think you're – I bet uh, – I got married young. I was 23. Had my, uh, I, for clarity, didn't have any kids. My ex wife had the kids. Mm. I was involved in the process early on. And, uh, <laughs> but she carried the kid and had the kid. It's funny when guys go, yeah, you know, we, I had, I had kids young. It's like, you didn't have any kids, fucker. Yeah. You, you were there at the very early process of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you will be a better parent because of the experiences that you have and the age that you are that you are now and moving forward. Mm. I think uh, there, and again, it's not right or wrong, but I think people should consider, if you have kids super young, some people are, I think, again, personal opinion, I think some people are really suited for that, but I also think that some people are in a rush to get there. Yeah, and you're still learning, even at that age. And you rob yourself <clears throat> of your chance to grow up and yes. to have experiences like you had. And I feel like oftentimes... That leads to a feeling of kind of resentment and regret. And 100%. that sucks. I don't want anybody to live with that. I think by, I mean, you've packed a lifetime of experiences in before the age of 30. All of that's going to translate to the experience that you would have with yes. kids as well. And 100%. So don't feel, uh, if you're having that potentially too deep conversation, don't feel don't feel bad if you want to wait on that one. It would actually wanna, be the advice. Wait a little bit longer. That would be the advice I would have given my younger self if I mm. could go back in time. Is I just Because I didn't know who I was. No. Yeah. At the age of 23, it's not like it should be prohibited from getting married, but I think people should t- take a beat, take a breath. I am i don't even recognize my 23-year-old self. Oh, I'm sure. It's a fucking retard, to use a completely <laughs> socially unacceptable word. <laughs> no, that's how, that's how I feel, too, honestly. And it's it's so funny, though. I don't know if you're the same as me, but when you when you look back and, and think about how you felt at that age, you always think you are you know, as, as smart and as wise oh, as you'll ever get. The things you cared about. You think about now irrelevant. Yes, your yep. perception perception of time is different. Oh yeah, your value scale is different. The things you worry about, yep, completely different. Yep, it's uh, yeah. I have uh, I've it's a tough battle as a parent, seeing your kids getting ready to make a mistake. Oh yeah, I'm sure. arguing with yourself. Should I stop this, or? Should I let them learn this lesson? I, I was going to say, though, like, uh, even contrary, contrary to what I said earlier about um, trying to help them learn lessons, I think no matter what someone says, and I, I say this because I've been through it myself, you'll never really learn unless you make the mistake and, and go through the hardship and, and yeah. you know, Agreed. learn learn it on your own. Yeah. Um, someone, someone could tell you a million times, don't do this, don't do this, and you're never really going to understand why you shouldn't do it until you figure it out through the... Uh, so yeah, parents who say never ever ever have sex, drugs, or alcohol. Yeah, it's like cool. <laughs> you ever been around seventeen, eighteen year olds? Yep. As, as soon as they leave your house and they're going out and hanging out with your friends. Yep. Let me just tell you, you're going to be lucky <laughs> if all three don't happen at the same time. <laughs> it's like, let's it's live true. in the real world. Yeah, and I, th- I think just what I've seen with my friends growing up, like the the more um, strict the parent was, the more rebellious and. Uh, Stupid, the kid, the kid was with what they were doing. So. Yeah, where are you calling home these days? L.A. Technically, um, that's horrible. Yeah, I have not have not been a big fan. There, there's like <laughs> there's some good aspects, but I'm ready to get out. Um, so we'll see. I don't have a lease here. I've been living with my buddy. He's been kind enough to just let me crash in his spare bedroom, um, but I don't have to be there for work anymore. So we'll see. Um, you get your eye on any places. I want to get some international experience, and I have a lot of friends in Qatar from my time over there during the World Cup. And I was thinking about doing something with. Uh, I, I met with with a woman, um, awesome lady from the U.S. Embassy, and some of the guys in the local government, the Mary Dewan there, which is like their equivalent of the White House. So thinking about maybe taking some time working over there just to get out into a totally different uh, world. Um, that or just settle down in a place like Montana. Like I lived between Utah and Colorado for 
a little over two years and I miss it every day. Yeah. Like LA sucks. New York sucks. Mountains are. Where it's we at. moved from a subdivision in San Diego that had hundreds of thousands of people mm. to here. Yeah. I'm sure never is. going back. <laughs> I am never going back. I don't if blame anything, you. I'll be just. How can I get farther into the woods? <laughs> like, this town has 40,000. Are there any that have four? Yeah. Let's yeah. investigate that. <laughs> Are there any that have 40? Well, actually, that might be a little fucked. But. <laughs> <laughs> I love it out here. I yeah. mean, it's like freedom as like in its uh, in its best form. So, What else do you guys have planned while you're up here? Uh, we're going to spend this week. I don't have a ticket home yet, so and I have no job. I'm like, what can I do next? I uh, like how you roll. Yeah. I mean, try to just enjoy life as it comes. Um my, my friend who got married, his parents got a lake house down by a little south of Lakeside. So we're going to stay there for the week. Um, and then I might just take another week. I have a wedding in, in Morocco, weekend of September 15th, 16th, whenever that Friday is. Yeah, so- me too. I just got to go to this <laughs> wedding in uh, Thailand. It's Michael and his boyfriend. But I'm like- <laughs> Congratulations, Michael. Congratulations. <laughs> um, Thank you. I got to be there about that date, but I might just stay out and maybe do some road tripping around Montana or... We'll see. So. Fuck, I wish I could be around to tour guide you. My hunting season starts, well, I'm driving out there Friday, but starting to chase elk on Saturday. Nice. Where are you uh, headed? We are going to be going, it's uh, it's tough to describe. Well, basically- Is between, it in Montana? Yes. Okay. It's in between Great Falls and Helena. It's kind of like equidistance between the two and off into the mountains. Okay. And it looks like the temperatures are going to be very reasonable, so hopefully they'll mm. be up and moving and talking. When nice. it's hot, like- the today I think is probably the last hot day of the year, mm-hmm. and it's gonna. It looks like the temperatures just snap right over into fall time temperatures. Oh really? Yeah, it's nice. gonna be seventies and sixties for cool. the next. Well, as far as the forecast shows me on the phone, but is that what happened? Elk start really moving once it gets a little. They'll bit move cold. around more. Okay. Um, when it's super hot, they just sit in the shade. Mm. They'll bugle and stuff, but they're laying yeah. down. And good luck trying to sneak up on that because I've yeah. tried and they <laughs> fuck me up. And I feel like I'm good at hide and seek. Yeah. So, are you a big hunter? I don't. I'm not a big hunter. I enjoy hunting season for sure. I'm going no. on a bow hunt. I have a few days off, and then I'm going to go on a rifle hunt. And then right after that is the Ireland trip. So nice, nice. That's it's going to be good. Something I wanted to get more into, but obviously LA is not the uh, the best place for hunting. Yeah, you're not going to have any elk there. <laughs> you could you could probably hunt day walkers or people that are fentanyl. Yeah. yeah. Or, <laughs> what's the other one? The uh, honestly, that's a dangerous hunt. Yeah, it's probably not legal either. You might end up seeing it on the <laughs> national news if you. If you partook in that. I'm sure, they could take a few bullets and then charge you, and might be dangerous. I'd be curious to see how LA and places like San Francisco navigate their way out of some of the social issues that they have going on. I don't know if it's recoverable. They better take. I, I don't know if it soon. is. Yeah, I fully agree. I just had this conversation with my my buddy's mom um, about how bad, especially in the West Coast, it's getting. Uh, LA is bad, but then I spent some time in Seattle. For we have a SpaceX as a satellite production facility up there, Seattle. Portland and uh, San Francisco, especially San Francisco, it is, it's terrible. It's um, like, I don't, I don't know now if you're seeing the videos with gangs of people running into uh, shops and totally. Yeah, they just take them. Yeah. And even the employees, they just film because I believe they're under a policy of just don't yep, even get involved. Are. What the fuck is going on? <laughs> it's, it's uh, like right at the edge of the societal breakdown is what's going on. Yeah. Like anarchy. It's insane. Yeah. And so. Are we going to allow a group of vigilantes with baseball bats to stop that shit? Maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like the theft and destruction of property, and it's always under the guise of, well, they have insurance. It's a major mm. corporation. Yeah, but then when those major corporations leave those areas and yeah. then the residents no longer have the ability to get the things that they need there, like, yep. like, you know what I mean? It's a cascading issue. Yes. I don't know. I feel like if somebody comes into your store and wants to put a bunch of stuff in a bag and you have a wooden Louisville slugger... <laughs> You should be able to stop that. I agree. I do. I'm not going to run for office on this particular <laughs> policy, but I feel like in Montana, if you try that shit, you're not getting out the door. Oh, for sure not. Yeah. No. It's not going to be a baseball bat. It's probably going to be a fucking shotgun. <laughs> as it should be, honestly. I mean, how, how, like, as the people who might be teetering on the edge of deciding they want to do something like this see the lack of repercussions, like, it's just going to get worse and worse. Yeah. And I, and I, until they change actual policy, mm-hmm. law enforcement can't do anything. They yeah, can only enforce the laws. They can't make them up. So It's insane. It is. I agree with you. And I don't understand. I do not understand why people tolerate it. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Like, like even, like, I don't care what your political stance is. That's just anarchy. That's, that's chaos. And that's like, what the fuck? That's not good for anybody, honestly. Yeah. I think for most people, they're – well, not that they're okay with it. They'd, it doesn't directly impact their life because of the few places that that that's, is happening. That's true. 
I feel like the people who are there and probably experiencing it are far more vocal, but just don't know what the hell to do about it. Yeah. And I bet if you did take a Louisville Slugger and gave a little, uh, you know, wood shampoo to somebody <laughs> stealing stuff, you would probably be the person going to jail, not the person. Yes, who would. that's true. And that's just fucked. Yep. So we'll see. Well, I mean, what do you think? Like with with all of the problems, especially in these West Coast cities, what do you think the solution is? Especially with homelessness, because that's like. When I was driving through the outskirts of uh, Seattle on my way down to LA last time, it was insane. Like Full the, encampments. In, like beyond anything I could have imagined. Like cities. I don't know if there is a solution. You know, is it Oregon, Michael, that decriminalized all drugs? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And so there, you know, there, there's these experiments going on with let's just go completely hands off. Mm-hmm. From my understanding, and I don't live there, um, it doesn't seem like those experiments are going well, mm. but they're not reversing course. No. They're not changing anything about it. I, I don't know. I don't know if there is a solution. What do you do when there's hundreds of thousands of people who are homeless in between San Francisco to San Diego? And mm-hmm. I get why they would move to that area because the weather's spectacular yep. most of the time. Yeah. I mean, is that a state government issue? Is that a federal government? I don't know. I, I have no idea. Um yeah, and then like speaking of Qatar, I'm over there in Doha, and obviously every every place has its own problems. But they have no homelessness, and uh, they have a lot of money, and they they put a lot towards, um, I guess, you know, places to help them, or maybe even psychiatric wards. I mean, a lot of these people have psychological problems, but uh, I don't know how much money can you put into like rebuilding these people. I mean, I, I think a lot are too far gone. I just don't know what the right answer is. Well, part of that conversation too is there are. In that population that we're talking about, there are people that would absolutely accept the help. Mm-hmm. And then there's another group, and I and I have no idea about the size or scale, but people want to take this really uh, intellectually disingenuous position and say, we just need to throw money at it. We need to provide them resources. Yeah, that's... Some of them don't want the resources or yep. money. Yep. And, and that sucks to say, and maybe it is because they are too far gone. And for people who are willing to accept the help and they actually want to level their life up... I would do everything I could, but 100%. for somebody who doesn't want to participate in that and they want to be homeless, yeah, I don't know what the fuck you do with that. I've, yeah, I have no idea, and I've thought about this a lot. It's just you can't just throw them in a like a psych ward, and it's basically like I don't know, putting them into a coma. There's, there's, yeah, I don't know. Your generation needs to solve it, though. Yeah, I guess mine's too old. <laughs> we'll see. And almost everybody running for president is also too old. So that's another problem there. I mean. <laughs> My God, Biden can barely walk in a straight line. What are you talking about? He's totally fine. <laughs> Mitch McConnell's. <laughs> did you see Mitch McConnell had a stroke, like a mini stroke? That actually was my first thought. Yeah, I'm like, this is what a stroke looks like on TV. Yeah, honestly. What are you trying to pull this up there, Michael? Concerning. Oh, I didn't mean to get it over there, but I don't know if you guys saw this. This is the San Francisco poop map. Oh, yeah, I, I've an, seen this. This is an app. <laughs> Please, Michael, highlight this on so the viewers can watch this as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so the yellow dots, everyone. Are piles of human shit. Nice. Every one of them is yeah. ID'd. And I mean, yeah, I mean human it's... or animal waste? Let's get more specific, people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Holy this shit. This doesn't do it. Just my, uh, one of my buddies from... Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, there we go. That's... Insane. <laughs> do you know how long human shit on the street needs to be a problem before somebody creates an app <laughs> like this? I mean, fuck. Yeah, that's... Uh... Oh, my God. Yeah, that, that, that is insane. Imagine living in a city where... No, no. I don't even want you to finish your question. The answer is no. <laughs> this, this looks like the, the Starlink map. And like, uh, instead of satellites, it's piles of shit. Yeah. Starlinked, maybe. <laughs> Good God. Yeah, I don't... I, I truly have no... I don't even have the beginning of a good answer as to what you do. I just, I don't know what to do. Me neither. And I, I've thought about it quite a bit. My, but my... I feel like we live in a world that where there are people smart enough. Like, I'm sure somebody had to have said to Elon more than once, you're psychotic to think of putting satellites that and completely encapsulate Earth for internet. Like, like okay. Oh, thousands of times. That's sure. what I'm saying. Yeah. And so I, I, I feel like it's solvable. I am not going to look at there's some shit. Is that the one out in the water, Michael? <laughs> Is that on the end of the pier? This one Let's here. zoom in on that shit. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, it's a floater. <laughs> <laughs> do any of these come with pictures, photos? I think attached? some of them do. Human or animal waste. Intersection of Barcadero and Howard Street. The Embarcadero. Sweet. 
but I don't know. I haven't seen. I was going to say my, my buddy, one of my best friends from SpaceX, was up um, at our Mountain View office, and he got dinner. I think it was at an In and Out with his buddy in, in Oakland, and. He parked his car, went in to order, and within five minutes, someone smashed the back of uh, his rental, took his laptop, took everything yeah. out, and did it to like five cars in quick succession. Nobody did anything, and the guy just got away. And it's just it's crazy. Now like. people park their cars with the windows down, so they and yeah. yep. nothing in the car, so people can clearly see there's nothing to take, in yeah. the hopes that they just move on. How fucked is that? It's, it's fucked. It is fucked. I think potentially controversial stance here. No, that, those are good. These and are I'm good. I'm not running on these platforms. <laughs> Controversial I came from an old job where we encountered things called V-bids, V-B-I-E-Ds. V-bids, okay. Let's pack a few cars with about 500 pounds of HME, homemade explosive, yeah. that are triggered by the window breaking. <laughs> I and support this. after a week of random cars sprinkled throughout there, let me be clear, there's going to be some collateral damage here. No. It's... It might modify behavior. If you that's, crack that's... a window, you vaporize. I think that's what we need. Honestly, that's what I was saying. It's like, I don't know if it's what we need, but I'm just saying. <laughs> Here's my controversial <laughs> take. This this is what we need. <laughs> I don't know. I mean. I, I think it's like a positive feedback loop where people, it takes one person to do X action. And if there's no repercussions and other people are going to go, well, that guy just you know made a couple thousand dollars from stealing these sandbags and nothing happened to him. Why don't I do that? I'm struggling. I can't find uh, a job. I'm going to go do that. And it's just going to continue to, to grow in itself. You know what sucks, too, is I'm already dreading the 2024 election cycle. Mm. I spend, I bet you they spend almost no time talking about stuff like that. No. And all of the time talking about issues that at, at the end of the day may seem like it has a great impact on people's lives, but it doesn't. <laughs> no, it doesn't. It drives, it drives me nuts. I was, right after well, the too. 2020 election, it's like, whew, take a little bit of a break from this. You're like two years off and they start this shit again. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not interested. Yeah, the problem is, it's like the, the media will focus on those issues. So then, that's what's ingrained in you know 90 percent of the nation's minds as issues that are are uh, most important. And then, of course, when politicians want to win over the majority of people, knowing that those issues are top of mind, they'll focus on talking about those issues. But it's like issues that really don't matter. I mean, I think in the U.S. especially, there's such a lack of attention on the internal problems. Um, the domestic problems, like, I don't know, I go over to, you fly into Lisbon and uh, airport in Portugal, and my dad, who hasn't really traveled much internationally, landed there, um, and he's like, what the fuck? Like, our airports don't look like this, and this is a country that's not by any means super wealthy, and their, yeah. their infrastructure is amazing, and I don't know, I think there's a, a lot of stuff we have to do home side, um, and it's just not what people are focused on, let alone the politicians. I agree, man. I totally agree. I want to get you back to your uh, friends so you can enjoy your time with them. What okay. would you like to close out with, Tyler? That's a good question. Um, what was your biggest takeaway from Everest? Hmm. My biggest... Ooh, this this will be interesting. I think... I, I was just talking about this the other day with some friends. I think um, being there made me realize that there are a lot of people who do these sorts of things. Um, regardless of the form that it takes that are there for the wrong reasons. So... A lot of people were there, and I think, um, you know, especially lately, uh, these sorts of people have been attracted to these things more with social media. But people are there to, you know, better build their brand. They're there for the Instagram from the top, the social media. And don't get me wrong, I love posting on my Instagram story and the occasional post to help. That's tell how I knew you story. were in Montana. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but to inspire people to show my family and friends what I'm up to. But um, there's some people who whose whole life revolves around it and some people go do Everest for the wrong reason I think um, my biggest takeaway is make sure you go and do things like this uh, for the right reason and for me Everest was you know overcoming a challenge being being there with myself uh, digging down deep and trying to find my way to the top and then there are people who are there for the wrong reason so just make sure you do these things for the right reason um, I would agree with you and I don't know what the right reason is. It's I, I'm sure it's all subjective, but like for me, it's always about the meditative state you find in the midst of this insane chaos. And in that state, whether it's you know something dangerous like Everest or just driving around Mongolia for three weeks, like you can learn a lot about yourself, and then life is good. Yeah, I don't know. It, as long, I think as long as the growth is coming from a personal perspective, there is no right or wrong because every yeah. we're, we're all out of the box different, and we can spackle holes, or you know what I mean, and fill yep. stuff in yep. and. 
there's probably 50 people who could go to Everest and get 50 different things out of it, but if they left it a better person than they went in, then there is no wrong answer. 100% true. Yeah. Yeah, I think the internal focus is so much more powerful than the external, even though almost everything in the modern world tries to get you to focus on the external. Yeah. Which is dog shit. Yep. So. Yeah, too many people get distracted. Yeah, man. It's good to see you again. Good to see you, too. Good we to should link you. up in some other obscure place, like a oil drilling barge in like the fucking sea of turkey if that's Sounds even great. a place yeah <laughs> <laughs> there it is cool yeah awesome man thanks for the time yeah thank you for having me